Welcome to this presentation of Hebrews chapter 7 through 13. Just to let you know, there are a lot of great and important significant doctrines in these chapters, and so this presentation will be a little longer than normal, but you will learn some great truths of the gospel that Paul teaches to the Hebrew saints. So with that in mind, let's start with the introduction. In Hebrews 7-13, the Apostle Paul continues to emphasize the preeminent role of Jesus Christ in the plan of salvation, focusing particularly on the superiority of the Savior's priesthood, atoning sacrifice, and ministry. Paul taught his readers that the ancient tabernacle and its mosaic ordinances prefigured Christ's sacrifice and that only through the shedding of his blood can we obtain remission of our sins and gain access to God's presence. The epistle to the Hebrews concludes with an eloquent exhortation for the saints to remain faithful including a discourse that presents scriptural examples of men and women who demonstrated extraordinary faith in Hebrews 11. Such examples can inspire us to live our own lives more faithfully. Let's start with Hebrews chapter 7, The Melchizedek Priesthood Brings Exaltation. Hebrews 7 verses 1 through 2, Melchizedek. To the man Melchizedek goes the honor of having his name used to identify the holy priesthood after the order of the Son of God, thus enabling men to avoid the too frequent repetition of the name of deity. All of God's high ancient high priests, none were greater. His position in the priestly hierarchy of God's kingdom was like unto that of Abraham, his contemporary whom he blessed and whom, upon whom he conferred the priesthood. Melchizedek was a great Old Testament high priest, prophet, and leader who lived after the flood and during the time of Abraham. He was called the King of Salem, which was Jerusalem, King of Peace, King of Righteousness, which is the Hebrew name of Melchizedek, and Priest of the Most High God. Other scriptures relate that Melchizedek converted the Aaronic, I'm sorry, conferred the priesthood upon Abraham, received tithes from Abraham, and was unsurpassed in his greatness. In the Epistle to Hebrews, Melchizedek stands as a prototype of the Son of God. In Doctrine and Covenants 121, we learn, Verily thus saith the Lord, the time is now come, that it, meaning tithing, shall be disposed by a council composed of the first presidency of my church, and of the bishop and his council, and by my high council, and by my own voice unto them, saith the Lord, even so, amen. So that Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek probably shows that Melchizedek was probably in the first presidency, since that is who is over the disposition of the tithes. Alma 13, 17 through 18 says, Now this Melchizedek was a king over the land of Salem, and his people had waxed strong in iniquity and abomination. Yea, they had all gone astray, they were full of all manner of wickedness. But Melchizedek, having exercised mighty faith and received the office of the high priesthood according to the holy order of God, did preach repentance unto his people. And behold, they did repent, and Melchizedek did establish peace in his land in his day. Therefore he was called the Prince of Peace, for he was the King of Salem, and he reigned under his father. So you can see the symbolism of Melchizedek being a king, a prince of priests, reigning under his father. All of these are prototypes and examples of Jesus Christ. The Joseph Smith translation of Hebrews 7 through 3, the phrase, the order of the Son of God, meaning the Melchizedek priest is so named to avoid the too frequent repetition of the name of deity. This priesthood is the power and authority of God whereby the worlds were made and by which this earth and all things incident thereto are governed. 
It is the supreme governing authority in the kingdom of God on earth and in all ages and is designed and intended to prepare men for exaltation in the kingdom of God. Everyone being ordained after this order and calling should have power by faith to break mountains, to divide the seas, to dry up waters, to turn them out of their course, to put at defiance the armies of nations, to divide the earth, to break every band, to stand in the presence of God, and to do all things according to his will, according to his command subdue principalities and powers, and this by the will of the Son of God, which was from before the foundation of the world. I underlined those phrases because to break mountains, to divide the seas, to drain waters of the course, can only be done if it's the will of God, and you have faith. That priest of power has that power if it's God's will, and he tells you to perform those actions. Hebrews 7, verse 3, the phrase, without father, without mother. The Joseph Smith translation of Hebrews 7, 3 clarifies that it was the priesthood that was without father, without mother. For this Melchizedek was ordained a priest after the order of the son, which was without father, without mother. This phrase indicates that, unlike the Levitical order in ancient times, the Melchizedek priesthood is not based on lineage alone. Excuse me. <coughs> Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles further explained, the right to this higher priesthood was not intended in the same way as was the case of the Levites and the sons of Aaron. Righteousness was an absolute requisite for the conferral of the higher priesthood. The Levitical priesthood in the Old Testament was by lineage, if you were the tribe of Levi. So that's what meant, would mean with father and with father, meaning your lineage. And Melchizedek is without lineage, it's by righteousness. And who is worthy is ordained to this priesthood. The Joseph Smith translation of Hebrews 7, chapter 4 through 10, the superiority of the Melchizedek priesthood. During this time, the Hebrew saints, which would be the Jewish saints, are having a very, very hard time with letting go of the law of Moses, letting go of the Levitical priesthood, that the priest of the Levitical priests were the most important. And Paul is trying to show that Christ has come with a higher authority. Melchizedek was the providing, presiding authority of God on earth in the days of Abraham. And as such, the great patriarch paid tithes to and was blessed by Melchizedek. This fact, and apparently a good many other things involving Melchizedek, were which are unknown to us, seem to have been well known to the Hebrew saints. Hence, without amplifying this concept, but simply by way of analogy and symbolism, Paul is able to set forth for his initial readers some historical allusions which remind them everlastingly that Melchizedek's authority was superior to Aaron's. As I said, they were struggling with this. The argument used is far more meaningful to a people indoctrinated with the concept of a hereditary priesthood than it is for us today who think of only personal worthiness, without reference to lineage where both Aaronic and Melchizedek authority are concerned. Verse 4, Melchizedek was superior to Abraham because he took tithes of Abraham, and he also gave him his priesthood benediction, the act of blessing. Verses 5 through 7, he is much more superior to the Levitical priests who take tithes from their Israelite brethren, but who, in Abraham, their progenitor, paid tithes to Melchizedek. The one who collects a tithe is greater than the one who pays it, and the lesser person is blessed by the greater. Verse 7, in both was Melchizedek was greater than Abraham. The Joseph Smith translation of Hebrews 7 verses 4 through 7 says, And he lifted up his voice, maybe Melchizedek, and he blessed Abraham. 
being the high priest and the keeper of the storehouse of God, with whom God had appointed to receive tithes for the poor. Wherefore Abraham prayed unto him tithes all that he had, of all the riches which he possessed, which God had given him more than which he had need. And it came to pass that God blessed Abraham and gave him to riches and honor and lands for an everlasting possession, according to the covenant which he had made and according to the blessing wherewith Melchizedek had blessed him. Verse 8, Paul is telling us he is superior to them, he being Melchizedek, further in respect that the little priests are men who die. What scripture witnesses to concerning Melchizedek is just his life. It's silent as to his family and death and points to the endless life of the divine inheritor of his priesthood. Verses 9 through 10. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tithe, paid the tenth through Abraham because when Melchizedek met with Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor, Paul meaning not yet born. Hebrews 7, verse 3 and 11 through 19, the Melchizedek priesthood moves us closer to God and leads to exaltation. One of Paul's purposes in Hebrews 7 was to show the Melchizedek priesthood's superiority over the Levitical or Aaronic priesthood and its accompanying ordinances. In verse 11, if perf Paul is trying to say, if perfection and exaltation were attainable to the Levitical priesthood, why was there a need for a change to the higher priesthood? Paul taught that perfection, or being made like unto the Son of God, does not come by the Levitical priesthood, but through Jesus Christ and his order of the priesthood. Verse 12, a change in priesthood changes the laws and ordinances. The Aaronic priesthood administered the law of carnal commandments or preparatory gospel. Preparatory gospel. The Melchizedek priesthood administereth the fullness of the gospel. All men are liars, the prophet Joseph Smith said, who say they are of the true church without the revelations of Jesus Christ and the priesthood of Melchizedek, which is after the order of the Son of God. Verse 13, He of whom these things are spoken is Jesus, who belonged to the tribe of Judah in which the old law recognizes no priesthood. Verse 14, Paul is saying, Jesus Christ sprang out of Judah, not Levi. Verses 14 through 16. So Paul taught that he, Melchizedek, he, I'm sorry, Paul taught that his right to the priesthood would be based not on ancestry, but on the power of endless life. The Melchizedek priesthood is the power by which men gain eternal life. Where this priesthood is, their men can work out their own salvation and gain a celestial fullness. And where this priesthood is not, there can be no full inheritance in the kingdom of God. As the premortal Jehovah, he had created the earth and governed the events of the Old Testament with the same priesthood power he would hold during his mortal ministry. Verse 17, the priesthood held by Melchizedek is the very priesthood promised to the Son of God during his mortal sojourn, sojourn, which is to say that Christ was to be like unto Melchizedek. The Melchizedek priesthood is the power of endless lives because it administers the ordinances that brings endless prosperity. See Doctrine and Covenants 130.19-24. through 24. Verses 18 through 19, Paul is telling us, For there is a disannulling of a preliminary role or provisional commandment, that is, that constituting the Levitical priesthood on account of its weakness and unprofitableness, that is, its inability to effect atonement for men's sins. For the law made nothing perfect, meaning the law of Moses. And there is uh, the subsequent introduction of a better hope from which we can draw near to God. The words, for the law made nothing perfect, are a par parenthesis. 
The particular commandment in question was a piece which the whole law which made nothing perfect. The Jewish Hebrew saints are struggling with that and still clinging to the law of Moses trying to gain exaltation through that. Elder Craig A. Cardin of the 70s, discussing the refining influence of the Melchizedek priesthood, said, quote, The priesthood also has the power to change our very natures. As Paul wrote, all those who are ordained into this priesthood are made like unto the Son of God. This likeness is not only in ordination and ordinance, but also in the perfecting of individual hearts, something that occurs in the process of time, as we yield to the enticings of the Holy Spirit and put off the natural man. When a man is ordained to the Melchizedek priesthood, he enters into an order by which he may be refined through service to others. End of quote. President Dallin H. Oaks of the First Presidency taught that through the that though the priesthood is conferred upon male members of the church, both men and women are blessed by the perfecting power of the priesthood and its ordinances. President Oaks quote. The blessings of the priesthood, such as baptism, receiving the Holy Ghost, the temple endowment, and eternal marriage, are available to men and women alike. We need to get over who holds the priesthood and be more concerned with using it worthily to bless our lives. The Joseph Smith translation of Hebrews chapter 7 verses 19 through 21. For the law of Moses was administered without an oath and made nothing perfect, but was only the bringing in of a better hope by which we draw nigh unto God, inasmuch as this higher priest was not without an oath, by so much was Jesus made the surety of a better testament. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto them, The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The end of the Joseph Smith translation. So you can see Joseph Smith added some great teachings. That there is no oath and covenant with the Aaronic priesthood, but there is an oath and covenant of eternal life with the Melchizedek priesthood. Therefore, it is higher and greater. Verse 19 in chapter 7, Perfection comes not through the law of Moses, but through the gospel. Verse 20, Callings in the Aaronic priesthood are conferred without an oath. Verse 21, Paul is saying, God swore an oath that Christ should be a priest forever. That is, through our Lord had possessed the priesthood in pre-existence, he would receive it anew in mortality and would have it forever in time and in eternity. And this sets the pattern for all who become sons of God and joint heirs with Christ. Every person upon whom the Melchizedek priest is incurred conferred, receives his office and calling in this higher priesthood with an oath and a covenant. The covenant is to this effect. One, man on his part solemnly agreed to magnify his calling in the priesthood to keep the commandments of God, to live by every word that proceedeth forth from the mouth of deity, and to walk in the paths of righteousness and virtue. And two, God on his part agrees to give such persons an inheritance of exaltation and godhood in his everlasting presence. The oath is the solemn attestation of deity, his sworn promise that those who keep their part of the covenant shall come forth and inherit all things according to the promise. So you can see how Paul is showing how much more important the Melchizedek priesthood is and how it can, you can gain eternal life and exaltation. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 22 through 24. Verse 22, the, free, the phrase, Jesus made a better surety means one who gives security for the fulfillment of agreement between two other parties, a guarantor or sponsor. 
the contrast in their ministries of intercession between the Levitical priest and the great high priest is striking. There were many, there were many, he but one. They serving during their mortal lives, I mean, the Levites, the Levitical priest, and he, Christ, continues to plead in harmless, undefiled. They offer daily sacrifices, animals for their own sins and for the sins of the people. He, Jesus Christ, knew no sin, but offered himself once for the sins of the world. Verse 24, they, the priest, had infirmities. He, Christ, was perfect. They served as priests without an oath under the law. There was the Aaronic priesthood, but he, Christ, brought the gospel, held the Melchizedek priesthood, and took his supreme position to intercede forever for his brethren because God swore with an oath that he should be consecrated forevermore. Hebrews 7.25, he is able to save them to the utmost that come unto God. The Greek word translated as utmost means completely and eternally. Thus, as recorded in Hebrews 7.25, Christ is able to save us completely and for all eternity. Elder J. Devon Cornish of the 70 explained that the real question we should ask ourselves is not whether Jesus Christ can save, but whether we are willing to place our faith in Christ and come unto God. Quote, some have a difficult time accepting in their hearts that when the Lord says he atoned for all, he means them too. They say to themselves, I believe that Jesus Christ died for the sins of mankind, but what I have done is so terrible or so, or so repeated that I don't think the atonement will work for me. Some who are faithful, uh, some who are faithful members of the church, actually seem to believe that they will never make it back to Heavenly Father's presence. It is the idea that Christ can save all mankind, but He may not be able to save me. Continuing his quote, others can sense that this idea is false and that Christ can save them, but they are not sure He will. The Book of Mormon prophet Jacob taught, quote, He cometh into the world that he may save all men, if they will hearken to his voice. For behold, he suffereth the pains of every living creature, both men, women, and children. 2 Nephi 9.21 The rest of Elder Colin, uh, quote, the question is not whether we are perfect or whether we are worth forgiving, but whether we are willing to admit when we do wrong, feel sorry, confess as appropriate, do all we can to set things right, and ask the Lord to forgive us. End of quote. So there's a difference in believing about Christ and believing in Christ. Do you believe in him? that his atonement works for you personally. Hebrews 7, verse 26, Jesus Christ lived a holy, harmless, undefiled life. Paul explained that Jesus Christ can save us because he lived a perfect life. Elder Bruce D. Porter of the 70 explained how the undefiled and perfect life of Jesus Christ was critical to his atonement. Quote, the trial of Jesus in Gethsemane would not have been possible and could not have occurred had it not been preceded by a lifetime of sinless virtue. From his temptation in the wilderness to his rejection in Nazareth to the illegal trial before the Sanhedrin, Christ paid the price of a perfect life, walking in holy sinlessness despite adversity, physical suffering, deep sorrows, and the snares of ruthless and determined adversaries, both seen and unseen. He suffered temptation, but gave no heed unto them. All this he did with the knowledge that one misstep would mean creation's doom. For he had sinned even in the smallest point, for had he sinned even in the smallest point or slightest negligence of thought, the atonement would have become impossible. 
and the whole purpose of our creation frustrated. The burden of the whole world weighed upon him through every moment of his life. Brothers and sisters, can you comprehend that? That's why he is tempted beyond what any of us will bear. There were no second chances for Christ like there was for us. There was no repentance for him. Either he stayed sinless, or if he does one mishap, he becomes a son of perdition. What pressure was on him? How faithful he is. Some have a difficult time. I mean, <clears throat> that, that was the end of the quote. The Joseph Smith translation of Hebrews 7, 25 for 26, for such a high priest became us. Here is the Joseph Smith translation. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and made ruler over the heavens, and not as those high priests who offered up sacrifice daily, first for their own sins and then for the sins of the people. For he, Christ, needeth not offer up sacrifice for his own sins, for he knew no sins, but for the sins of the people. And this he did once when he offered up himself. The bolden is what Joseph Smith added, the, the bold that I have in there. You can see the significance and how Paul is teaching. That's why they are continually offering animal sacrifices because it did not forgive sin. It was to point to the one who would offer once himself for sin. And so the animal sacrifices were only effective if you used them to remember Christ, put your faith in him, and then he is the one that would save you. And so that's why they were continually offering animal sacrifices, because they continually needed to be reminded to put their faith in Jesus Christ and his eternal sacrifice. Hebrews 7, 27-28. Verse 27, the phrase, who need not daily, meaning a reference to the endless repetition of sacrifices throughout the year, evidence that these sacrifices never effectively and, fi effectively and finally dealt with sin. First, for his own sins, that phrase, meaning Christ's priesthood, is superior because he had no personal sins for which Christ must be made. The phrase once for all, meaning a key phrase in Hebrews, the Levitical priest had to bring daily offerings to the Lord, whereas Jesus sacrificed himself once for all. The phrase offered up himself. Levitical priests offered up only animals. Our high priest, referring to Christ, offered himself the perfect substitute. Verse 28, the phrase, high priests which have infirmities, because one, they are mortal and they are impermanent. Two, they are sinful and free. three, they could only offer animals, which could never provide a genuine substitute for man who is made in the image of God. Verse 28, the phrase, the word of the oath, which was since the law, meaning, the law of minister, the lesser priesthood, came through Moses. Over 400 years later, through David, the Lord swore that his son would have the higher priesthood, which administer the gospel and therefore supplants the law of Moses. The Lord swore that his son, meaning Christ being the son of David, meaning coming through the lineage of David. Abraham and Melchizedek at Salem. Abraham's instruction to go to the land of Moriah to offer his offering of his son is the first biblical reference to a place called Moriah. Numerous and long-standing Jewish Christian traditions, as well as the historian Josephus, all support the thesis that Moriah is the same place as Jerusalem's Temple Mount. The biblical record itself indicates that Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah, which the Lord appeared unto David. 
partly because of the sanctity of the place, David purchased the rock on Moriah, Moriah to make an altar to the Lord, and he instructed Solomon to build the holiest edifice in ancient Israel at that spot. But what about Abraham a millennium earlier? Did he make the long, strenuous trek to the same holy hill to enact one of the most stirring and emotional scenes in all of history because there was something sacred about that place already? We do know Abraham had met with Melchizedek sometime before at the Valley of Sheva, which is the king's dell, identified in biblical times, and today as the confluence of the Kidron, Triponian and Hinnom valleys southeast of the city of David, that is, Old Testament Jerusalem. We know, too, that Melchizedek ruled over his people as Salem, later called Jerusalem. I'm, Salem, later called Jerusalem. The ancient Israelite psalmists used the names interchangeably in synonymous parallelism. Quoting, in Salem, also in his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion, Psalm 76, 2. Melchizedek was a type of the Savior. Both are called King of Righteousness, the literal meaning of Melchizedek or Melchizedek, and both are referred to as Prince of Peace. Melchizedek grew up as a prince and then reigned as king in Salem, reigning under or after his father. See Alma 13.28. Jesus, too, was of royal lineage through Mary, and if the country had not been under Roman sub subjugation at the time, Jesus had the potential to have been king in Jerusalem. As it was, he was accepted by the righteousness as their true king. Melchizedek converted his wicked people to righteousness and established such a great degree of peace and righteousness that they obtained heaven. They were translated to join the city of Enoch. That's in Joel Smith's translation, Genesis 14, verse 34. Jesus provided the way for all men and women to obtain heaven and be exalted. And it is likely that both Melchizedek and the Savior accomplished their mortal missions at the same place. Melchizedek was born king and God's high priest. The holy priest of God was thus exercised in Jerusalem a thousand years before David established the priestly order and Solomon built the temple. I apologize for the typo there. Melchizedek was also keeper of the storehouse of God at Salem, at which later Abraham paid tithes. Anciently, Israel's temple also served as the storehouse and treasury of the kingdom. How could a great high priest function in his priesthood without a tabernacle or temple? Or how could a people establish such righteousness that they were transferred from this celestial world without having the blessings of of the temple. The prophet Joseph Smith taught that the main object of gathering the people of God in any age of the world is to build unto the Lord a house whereby he could reveal unto his people the ordinances of his house and the glories of his kingdom and teach people the way of salvation. For there are certain ordinances and principles when they are taught and practiced must be done in a place or house built for that purpose, end of his quote. It is possible that a temple or sanctuary existed on Moriah during Abraham's lifetime. One early historian wrote that Melchizedek, the righteous king, for such he was, really was, on which account he was there the first priest of God and first built a temple there and called the city Jerusalem, which was formerly called Salem. During the time Melchizedek was the Lord's presiding authority on the earth, there were many before him, and also there were many afterwards, but none were greater. He and Abraham lived not far from each other in Canaan. Abraham, early in his life, has wanted to be a prince of peace, as was Melchizedek. Abraham received the priesthood from Melchizedek, though we do not know when or where. 
Abraham tells us, I sought for the blessings of the Father and the rights whereunto I should be ordained to administer the same, having been myself a follower of righteousness, possibly a title denoting God and his Son, who is called Son of Righteousness. Recall that Malik Sadiq means King of Righteousness. Desiring also to be one who possesses greater knowledge and to be a greater follower of righteousness, and to possess a greater knowledge and to be a father of many nations, a prince of peace, and desire to receive instructions and to keep the commands of God, I became a rightful heir, a high priest, holding the right belonging to the fathers. It was conferred upon me from the fathers." by which we understand that Melchizedek bestowed on him the priesthood, either in the land of the Chaldeans or in the land of Salem. When Abraham sought for his appointment unto the priesthood, he either traveled to Canaan or else Melchizedek traveled to Mesopotamia. We may conclude that for Abraham, Moriah was already a place with holy associations when he took Isaac there to be bound and offered up. That present and future continually came together at this sacred space. To be sure, the mount was for centuries a place of sacrifices in anticipation of the great sacrifice that would be accomplished there. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 8 now. Christ offers himself as a sacrifice for sin. Hebrews 8, chapters 1 through 13, Jesus Christ is the mediator of a better covenant. Everything connected with the law, all its rites, sacrifices, rites, ordinances, and performances, everything, without any exception, was so designed and so done as to bear record of Christ who was to come of his atoning sacrifice. All these things, meaning the law of Moses, Abinadi says, were types of things to come, Mosiah 13.31. Just as the Levitical high priest was a minister of the Jerusalem temple or earthly sanctuary and appointed to offer sacrifice, so Christ is the minister, even gatekeeper, of the heavenly sanctuary, the celestial kingdom, who offered the ultimate sacrifice himself. In Hebrews 8, Paul summarized the ideas of the previous chapter and exclaimed and explained that because Jesus Christ's atoning sacrifice was superior in every way to the temple offerings made by Levitical priests, he became the mediator of a better covenant. The ter Greek term translated as mediator Mediator in Hebrews 8.6 refers to a third party who stands between two others to resolve their differences and to bring them together. Jesus Christ is the mediator through whom the gospel covenant is established between Heavenly Father and us. Paul also called this better covenant a new covenant, quoting from Jeremiah 31.31-34. 31, 31 to show his Jewish Christian readers that the Lord had revealed to Old Testament prophets that he would someday make a new covenant with Israel that would supersede the old. See Hebrews 8, 8 through 12. God's covenant of salvation is the fullness of the gospel. When men accept the gospel, they thereby agree or covenant to keep the commandments of God, and he promises or covenants to give them salvation in his kingdom. The gospel is the everlasting covenant because it is ordained by him who is everlasting, and also because it is everlastingly the same. In all past ages, salvation was gained by adherence to its terms and conditions, and that same compliance will bring the same reward in all future ages. Each time this everlasting covenant is revealed, it is new to those of that dispensation. Hence, the gospel is the new and everlasting covenant." Any age, past, present, or future for eternity will be saved by the same terms and conditions and covenants of the gospel that we have today.
The prophet Joseph Smith noted that although Jews in New Testament times were generally rejected in in New Testament times, generally rejected this new covenant, it would again be offered to them at a later time. This covenant has never been established with the house of Israel, nor with the house of Judah, for it requires two parties to make a covenant, and those two parties must be agreed, or no covenant can be made. Christ, in the days of his flesh, meaning when he was on the earth, proposed to make a covenant with them, the Jewish people, but they rejected him and his proposals, and in consequence thereof they were broken off, and no covenant was made with them at that time. But their unbelief has not rendered the promises of God of none effect. No, for there was another day limited in David, which was a day of his power, and then his people Israel should be a willing people, and he would write his law in their hearts and print it in their thoughts. Their sins and their iniquities he would remember no more. So someday in a future day, the house of Israel and the Jews will make the new and everlasting covenant and will come into the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We are slowly doing that with mission work, but there will come a day in the millennium where they will come in such numbers that we will stand in awe. Hebrews chapter 9, Mosaic Ordinances Prefigured Christ's Ministry. Hebrews 9, verses 1 through 7 once every year. Paul continued his comparison between Levitical high priests and Jesus Christ by discussing the work of the high priest on the Day of Atonement. On the left is a picture of the tabernacle, the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies, and the altar of sacrifice, the shoe bread, the candlestick, the altar, and how everything was placed in the tabernacle. Because Paul is going to refer to that. Once a year on the Jewish day called the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the high priest was permitted to enter into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle or later the Jerusalem temple. The Holy of Holies is referred to as the second tabernacle in Hebrews 9, 3 through 5 and 7. On that day, the high priest, clothed in white linen, took a bullock as a sin offering and a ram as a burnt offering for himself and his house, and he two, and two he goats as a sin offering. He then cast lots upon the two goats. One was to be for the Lord for a sin offering, the was, the other was sent away alive in the wilderness, the scapegoat. He then killed the bullock, his own sin offering, and taking a censer full of live coals from off the brazen altar with two handfuls of incense into the Holy of Holies, cast the incense on the coals there so that the cloud of smoke might cover the mercy seat, as it were, hid him from God. He then took of the blood of the bullock and sprinkled it once on the east part of the mercy seat as an atonement for the priesthood, and seven times before the mercy seat, as an atonement for the Holy of Holies itself. Then he killed the goat, the congregation sin offering, and sprinkled its blood in the same manner with corresponding objects. Over the scapegoat, the high priest confessed all the sins of the people of Israel, after which it was sent by a hand of a man into wilderness to bear away their iniquities into a solitary land. This ceremony signified the sending away of the sins of the people, meaning their, the sins were sent away. They were not atoned for yet. They were not taken care of. This scapegoat symbolized that there would be a future lamb that would come and that would be sacrificed sins of the people, that the lamb was let go into the wilderness was symbolism that there was still yet a lamb to come to be offered, meaning the lamb of God. 
Hebrews 9, verses 8 through 10. Verse 8, the point is that entrance into the presence of God was restricted to the high priest alone, and that only once a year, and that was altogether denied to the people and even to the ordinary priest. The argument of this whole section is that the Levitical system did not and could not provide real access to God. The phrase holiest of all meant the holy place, meaning here probably the real presence of God, the heavenly sanctuary, as in verse 12. Verse 9, which, that is, the holy place, was a figure for the time then present, meaning that it pointed the worshipers of that time forward to the drawing of a better time to come since it could not deal effectively with sin. Verse 10, the phrase, until the time of Reformation, meaning that the new covenant of the Melchizedek priesthood introduced by Christ. Hebrews 9, verses 11 through 15, and verses 22 through 28, and then chapter 10, verse 1, Jesus Christ as the high priest and mediator. In this chapter, you're seeing Christ is trying to show that the Levitical priesthood and its ordinances and the things in the sanctuary did not have power to save. Only one person could go into the Holy of Holies, which symbolized exaltation, the celestial kingdom. And that was just once a year. And so it was just a teaching type that someone was to come in the future who would let everybody enter into the Holy of Holies. And so Paul's trying to show that all these things were symbolism of Christ. The ordinance performed by ancient Levitical priests foreshadowed the atonement made by the Son of God. Ancient priests offered up goats or lambs from Israel's flocks. The Lamb of God voluntarily offered up himself. That would be Christ. The high priest offered sacrifices in this manner every year on the Day of Atonement. Christ offered his sacrifice once for all. As the ancient high priest entered into the Holy of Holies on earth and sprinkled the goat's blood on the mercy seat for the sins of Israel, so Jesus Christ, our mediator, entered the sanctuary of heaven itself, there to intercede by virtue of his own spilt blood before the Father in behalf of those who would repent. Thus, Jesus was not only the high priest for us in making the offering, he was also the very offering himself. Jesus came to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The blood of animals could not atone for our sins. Their sacrifice or the shedding of their blood was a shadow of the future shedding of the blood of God. Only the great and last sacrifice could be an atonement. Now, there was forgiveness in the Old Testament, and the way it happened is that people would offer up the animals but, but saw the symbolism of Christ and put their faith in him. And so because faith in Christ would, could also work retroactive even before it happened. And they could be forgiven of their sins in the Old Testament times. Not because of the blood of the animal, but because of their faith in the blood of Christ that they saw in the animal. Hebrews 9 verse 11, Jesus Christ is our high priest of God, of good things to come. Elder Jeffrey R. Harland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles drew upon Paul's description of Jesus as the high priest of good things to come in order to provide encouragement to those struggling in despair. Quote, Every one of us has times when we need to know things will get better. Moroni spoke of it in the Book of Mormon as hope of a better world. For emotional health and spiritual stamina, everyone needs to be able to look forward to some respite, to something pleasant and renewing and hopeful, whether that blessing be near at hand or still something distant at hand. It is enough just to know we can get there, that however measured or far away, there is the promise of good things to come. My declaration is that this is precisely what the gospel of Jesus Christ offers us, especially in times of need. There is help. There is happiness. 
There really is light at the end of the tunnel. It is the light of the world, the bright and morning star, the light that is endless, that can never be darkened. To any who may be struggling to see that light and find that hope, I say, hold on, keep trying. God loves you. Things will improve. Christ comes to you in his more excellent ministry with a future of better promises. He is your high priest of good things to come. End of quote. Hebrews 9, verse 15 through 17, death of the testator. Paul wrote that where a testament is, there must also not be, I'm sorry, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator, Hebrews 9.16. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained the meaning of Paul's language. Brother McConkie said, in legal usage, a testator is one who leaves a valid will or testament at his death. The will or testament is the written document wherein the testator provides for the disposition of his property. As used in the gospel sense, a testament is a covenant. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant or testament, that is, of the gospel which came to replace the law of Moses. In these verses, Paul used both the legal and the gospel definition of terms and teaches that it is through Christ's death that gifts are willing to men. In other words, Christ had to die to bring salvation. I'm sorry, I read that last part. Christ's death that gifts are willed to men. In other words, Christ had to die to bring salvation. The testament or covenant of salvation came in force because of the atonement worked out in connection with that death. Christ is the testator. His gift, as would be true of any testator, cannot be inherited until his death. Christ died that salvation might come. It should be noted that Joseph Smith's translation uses covenant in place of testament in every instance in Hebrews 9, verses 15 through 20. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 18 through 28, without shedding of blood is no remission of sin. As Paul taught that both the Old Covenant and the New Covenant required the blood of a sacrifice, he observed that without the shedding of blood is no remission. Blood is symbolic of life. Sin offerings under the law of Moses required the shedding of animals' blood. In setting forth the laws respecting sacrificial ordinances in ancient Israel, the Lord explained, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. That's Leviticus 17.11. The blood of animals ratified the old covenant, foreshadowing the shedding of Jesus Christ's blood that ratified the new covenant and made the remission of sins possible. So that's why, even before it happened, those in the Old Testament could be forgiven if they saw Christ in the offering and put their faith in Christ and came unto him. The blood of goats has been shed for centuries to ritually cleanse and sanctify the people. Paul, however, taught that it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. The Savior was once offered to bear the sins of many, and this was the only true sacrifice. Hebrews 9, 23-24, a shadow of good things to come. Paul used certain words to show how the sacrifices and practices of the law of Moses served as types or similitudes of things to come, patterns, figures, shadows, and image and remembrance. The Old Testament priestly duties and temple sacrifices pointed to Jesus Christ's great atoning sacrifice. And the great mistake that the house of Israel made in the Old Testament is they lost that idea. They turned the law of Moses into salvation itself, that it would save you. They lost that its whole point was to point to Christ. And that's why they struggled so much. 
we do the same today. Sometimes we turn the gospel and all of its programs that we have into things that will save us. There is not one program in this church that has any saving power. Only the atonement of Jesus Christ does and faith in him through repentance. Chapter 10, we are sanctified by the shedding of the blood of Christ. As he now concludes this portion of his presentation, Paul summarizes his teachings on the law of sacrifice in this way. 1. Salvation is in Christ and comes through the shedding of his, his blood. Men are sanctified through his blood and in no other way. 2. The sacrifices of the Mosaic Law were types and shadows of our Lord's atoning sacrifice and were to point Israel's attention forward to that transcendent event. Three animal sacrifice, standing alone of themselves without more, were imperfect, and neither remitted sin nor brought salvation. Rather, they had efficacy and virtue only because of Christ's sacrifice. Number four, sacrifices were now done away in Christ. Five, and thus it fulfilled the Lord's promise through Jeremiah that in a day subsequent to the law of Moses, God would give a new covenant which would abolish the sins and iniquities of the people. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Verse 1, the sacrifices of the law were ineffective to cleanse the conscience as shown by their continual repetition. Verse 2, if the sacrifices under the law of Moses could take away sin, then would they have not ceased, then they, then would they have not ceased to be offered. Now, verse 3, however, the continual sacrifices made were meant to remind the people that something greater needed to happen to rid, to be rid of sin. Verse 4, the sacrificing of animals which could not take away sins were a shadow to remind the people that there needed to be an eternal, infinite and eternal sacrifice. As Alma 34 verses 10 through 11 say, For it is expedient that there should be a great and last sacrifice, yea, not a sacrifice of man, neither of beast, neither of any manner of fowl, for it shall not be a human sacrifice, but it must be an infinite and eternal sacrifice. Now there is not any man that could sacrifice his own blood which will atone for the sins of another. End of the quote from Alma. In Hebrews 10, verses 5 through 9, Paul quotes Psalms 46 through 8 as found in the Septuagint, that's the Greek version, rather than the King James Version, which Messianic prophecy proclaims in thought content that when the Lord comes into mortality to dwell in the body prepared for him, sacrifices and burnt offerings will be done away. This was affirmed in plain words to the Nephites by the risen Lord, quoting 3 Nephi 9, 19 to 20, quote, Ye shall offer up unto me no more the shedding of blood, yea, your sacrifices and your burnt offerings shall be done away, for I will accept none of your sacrifices of your burnt offerings, and ye shall offer for a sacrifice unto me a broken heart and a contrite spirit. So that is the sacrifice we are to offer that replace the animal sacrifice of the law of Moses. Chapter 10, verse 5, the phrase, a body hast thou prepared me, meant this phrase is not found in the prophecy as recorded in the King James Version, but is found in the same prophecy in the Septuagint, or the Greek Version. Paul's use of it certifies to its verity, and it is certainly an expressive and clear pronouncement relative to our Lord's birth into mortality. Chapter 10, verse 9, the phrase, He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second, meant the law of sacrifice is done away in Christ. He, take away, he took away the rites required in the Mosaic system that he might establish the preeminence of his own atoning sacrifice. Chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus was offered, one, uh, was offered once for all. 
The epistle to the Hebrews repeatedly emphasizes the difference between the sacrifices under the law of Moses, which had to be offered over and over again, and the sacrifices of Jesus Christ, which was made once for all. President Russell M. Nelson explained how the Savior's one-time offering was infinite in scope. Quote, Jesus Christ's atonement is infinite, without an end. It was also infinite that all humankind would be saved from never-ending death. It was infinite in terms of its immense suffering. It was infinite in time, putting an end to the preceding, preceding prototype of animal sacrifice. It was infinite in scope. It was to be done once for all. End of quote. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 14. Under the law of Moses... Priests ministered daily in offering sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But this man, Christ, would offer once a sacrifice for sin, enabling the Savior to henceforth reign until his enemies be made his footstool. And through that one offering, Christ enables mankind to become perfected and sacrificed. As Alma 34, 13 through 15 says, It is expedient that there should be a great and last sacrifice. And then shall there be, or it is expedient there should be, a stop to the shedding of blood. Then shall the law of Moses be fulfilled, yea, it shall all f fulfill. Yet it shall all, it shall be all fulfilled, every jot and tittle, and none shall have passed away. And behold, this is the whole meaning of the law, every whip pointing to the great and last sacrifice, and that great and last sacrifice will be the Son of God, yea, infinite and eternal. And thus he shall bring salvation to those who shall believe on his name, this being the intent of this last sacrifice, to bring out the bowels, to bring about the bowels of mercy, which overpowereth justice, and bringeth about means unto men, that they may have faith unto repentance. End of Alma's quote. Chapter 10, verse 11, sacrifices which can never take away sins, meaning of themselves they cannot. The, Moses, the law of Moses alone is not enough. Forgiveness comes through the atonement of Christ, but the faithful compliance of ancient Israel with the laws of the Lord did sanctify them before him because of the atonement which was to be. So there were some in Israel who saw that the law of Moses pointed to Christ and put their faith in him. And therefore, they received higher and greater blessings. But the majority of Israel in the Old Testament did not and could not, did not see the atonement of Christ in the law of Moses. And therefore, they turned the law of Moses into salvation itself. Chapter 10, verses 15 through 18. This argument is persuasive since the new covenant coming after the law of Moses was to free men from sin. Why then continue the old covenant to do what it is now accomplished by the new? The finality of his sacrifice is also confirmed by the Holy Ghost and the prophecy which foretells that under the new covenant God will remember the people's sins no more, implying that sin had been dealt with, fine, with, fina, with, with finally and forever. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 19 through 20, the veil of his flesh. Having established the image of Jesus Christ as high priest entering into the Holy of Holies, or the presence of God, to intercede for us through his blood, Paul then exhorted his readers to follow Christ into God's presence by a new and living way, which he had consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Just as the veil of the ancient tabernacle or temple provided access to the Holy of Holies, in Paul's metaphor, the flesh of Jesus Christ offered as a sacrifice for sin, raised to resurrected glory, enables us to enter into God's presence. In each case, this was the only means provided to enter. Chapter 10, verses 19 through 25 talks about the atonement for sin is no longer made by the high priest in Israel when he passes through the veil of the temple into the Holy of Holies. 
See Hebrews 6, 19 through 20. Now there is a new way, a living way, for the veil of the old temple was rent with the crucifixion. See that in Matthew 27, 50 through 51. Now Jesus had passed through the veil into heaven itself while he lived. His mortal flesh stood between him and the eternal holy of holies. For flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But now he has, as it were, rent the veil of his flesh through the death and entered into the fullness of his Father's kingdom through resurrection. Yea, saints of God, since Christ our Lord has redeemed us by his blood, since he has made salvation available through the new gospel covenant, since he as the high priest over the church now opens to us the door to his kingdom, since we have cast off the sins of the world through his blood and are now clean before him, let us keep the commandments. Let us hold fast to the church. Let us lead and guide each other to do good works. Let us meet together oft and exhort each other in the cause of righteousness. It should be remembered that Hebrews was written to church members who were wondering whether it would be better to return to the Jewish faith. Elder Jeffrey Allhallen spoke of the challenges faced by the Hebrew saints and likened the message of Hebrews to us. Quote, Paul says to those who thought a new testimony, a personal conversion, a personal baptismal experience would put them beyond trouble, to these he says, Call to remember the former days in which, after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great flight of afflictions. Then this tremendous counsel, which is at the heart of my counsel to you, cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. That is the way it has always been, Paul says, but don't draw back, don't panic and retreat, don't lose your confidence, don't forget how you once felt, don't distrust the experiences you had. This opposition turns up almost any place sometime. Let me try it again. This opposition turns up almost any place something good has happened. It can happen when you're trying to get an education. It can hit you after your first month in your new mission field. It certainly happens in matters of love and marriage. It can occur in situations related to family, church callings, or career. With any major decision, there are cautions and considerations to make. But once there has been illumination, beware the temptation to retreat from a good thing. If it was right when you prayed about it and trusted it and lived for it, it is right now. Don't give up when the pressure mounts. Certainly don't give in to that being who's bent on the destruction of your happiness. Face your doubts, master your fears, cast away therefore your confidence. Stay the course and see the beauty of life unfolded for you. End of quote. Chapter 10, verse 21, a high priest over the house of God. And high priest over the church, both on earth and in heaven, Christ as the great high priest, who atoning sacrifice was the culmination of all sacrifices of all the priests in Israel from the beginning of the nation to the day he hung on the cross. Verse 22, the phrase, heart sprinkled, bodies washed, meant an apparent allusion to those ordinances whereby the saints of the new covenant are made clean through conformity to the Lord's law, even as Aaron and his sons were washed in the days of the old covenant. Verse 25, the phrase, exhorting one another, the saints have an obligation to exhort and teach one another. The phrase, the day, meant the second coming. Hebrews 10, 26 and 29, sinning willfully after knowing the truth. Paul taught that those who sin willfully, knowing their actions are wrong, will experience much sore punishment because they disrespect the sacrifice of the Son of God. In the pamphlet for the strength of you, we read, Some people knowingly break God's commandments, planning to repent later, such as before they go on to the temple or serve a mission. Such deliberate sin mocks the Savior's atonement. 
chapter 10, verses 26 to 27, Paul is saying there is no forgiveness for those who receive a perfect knowledge of the truth and who then sin willfully and defy the truth. Chapter 10, verse 29, Every member of the church must live as becometh a saint or suffer the consequences, for there is a possibility that man may fall from grace and depart from the living God. Therefore, let the church take heed and pray always, lest they fall into temptation. Yea, even let those who are sanctified take heed also. Even though a person has his calling and election made sure and is sealed up into eternal life, he still has his agency. He can still fall. He can still choose to serve Satan. But if he does, having had a perfect knowledge of the truth and now choosing to defy God, to trample his son underfoot and to do despite to the spirit of grace, he is damned eternally as a son of perdition. Joseph Smith said, If men have received the good word of God and tasted of the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, it is impossible to renew them again, seeing they have crucified the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. So there is a possibility of falling away. You could not be renewed again, and the power of Elijah cannot seal against this sin, for this is a reserve made in the seals and power of the priesthood. Chapter 10, verse 31. It is a fearful thing to suffer the wrath of God with the devil and his angels in eternity, to be cast into the lake of fire and to die the second death, to go away into eternal and everlasting punishment, to be tormented where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, to become a son of perdition. Chapter 10, verse 32, illuminated, meaning enlightened, received the gospel. Chapter 10, verse 33, the phrase reproaches and afflictions means such are the common lot of all the saints in all ages. None can forsake the world without being reproached and afflicted by those who are worldly. Those who are trying to live the gospel and become like God will be mocked by the world. And you must be willing to suffer that. Chapter 10, verse 39, the phrase, them who drop back into perdition meant those who turn from righteousness, serve Satan, become his sons, sons of perdition. Knowing the struggles the Hebrew saints were facing, Paul exhorted his readers to be patient. The word patient in Hebrews 10 and 12 is translated from a Greek word meaning endurance or perseverance. Elder Neil A. Maxwell, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, discussed patience and the part it plays in the enduring to the end. Quote, Paul wrote of how, even after faithful disciples had done the will of God, they had need of patience. How many times have good individuals done the right thing initially, only to break under subsequent stress? Sustaining correct conduct, conduct for a difficult number moment under extraordinary stress is very commendable, but so is coping with sustained stress subtle, pre, pre, subtly present in seemingly routineness. Either way, however, we are to run with patience in the race that is set before us, and it is a marathon, not a dash. End of quote. We now go to Hebrews chapter 11. By faith we understand the work of God. Paul now launches into one of his great pieces of inspiring writing as he defines and illustrates the law of faith by which the worlds are and by which salvation comes. That faith which is the power of God himself, that faith which has preserved the saints of all ages and will raise the righteous to be like God and to sit with Christ on his throne. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrew 11 recalls examples of faithful individuals in the past and the righteous deeds they performed through their faith in order to give readers assurance and confidence to endure in faith and to attain promised blessings. The Joseph Smith translation of Hebrews chapter 11 replaces the word evidence 
with assurance. See footnote B. Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles drew upon these images to explain that faith leads us to remember past assurances, face the future, and take action in the present. Quote, the Apostle Paul defined faith as the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Alma declared that faith is not a perfect knowledge. Rather, if we have faith, we hope for things which are not seen, but which are true. Additionally, we learn in the lectures on faith that faith is the first principle in revealed religion and the foundation of all righteousness, and that is also the first principle of action in all intelligent beings. These teachings of Paul and of Alma and from the lectures of faith highlight three basic elements of faith. One, faith as the assurance of things hoped for which are true. Two, faith as the evidence of things not seen. And three, faith as the principle of action in all intelligent beings. I describe these three components of faith in the Savior as simultaneously facing the future, looking to the past, and initiating action in the present. Faith, as the assurance of things hoped for, looks to the future. Faith in Christ is inextricably tied to and results in hope in Christ for our redemption and exaltation. And assurance and hope make it possible for us to walk to the edge of the light and take a few steps into the darkness, expecting and trusting the light to move and illuminate the way. The combination of assurance and hope initiates action in the present. Faith, as the evidence of things not seen, looks to the past and confirms our trust in God and our confidence in the truthfulness of things not seen. We step into the darkness with assurance and hope, and we, re and we received evidence and confirmation as the light, in fact, moved and provided the illumination we needed. The witness we obtained after the trial of our faith is evident that enlarges and strengthens our assurance. Assurance, action, and evidence influences each other in an ongoing process. End of quote. For me, the most helpful definition of faith is this. One, doing what God wants. Two, how God wants it done. And three, when he wants it done. Following these three steps requires that we put our trust in God since we do not always know the outcome or evidence of what is involved to accomplish God's designs, but having an assurance that whatever God commands is right. Hebrews 11.2, the elders, the ancients, those good deeds Paul is now going to reportedly report approvingly. Since the brother named all held the Melchizedek priesthood, they each carried also the priestly title of elder. Hebrews 11.3, 3, through faith, worlds were framed. As Paul began to recount scriptural examples of great work done through faith, he started with the creation of the world itself. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. The lectures on faith discuss how the worlds were framed by faith. It says, The principle of power which existed in the bosom of God by which the worlds were framed was faith, and that it is by reason of this principle of power existing in deity that all created things exist, so that all things in heaven, on earth, or under the earth exist by reason of faith as it exists in him. Had it not been for the principle of faith, the worlds would never have been framed. Neither would man have been formed of the dust. It is the principle by which Jehovah works and through which he exercises power over all temporal as well as eternal things. Elder Joseph B. Worsen of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught that faith is a principle of power. Quote, Truly understood and properly practiced, faith is one of the grand and glorious powers of eternity. It is a force powerful beyond our comprehension. Through faith, the worlds were framed by the word of God. Through faith, waters are parted, the sick killed, the wicked silenced, and salvation made possible. 
Our faith is the foundation upon which all of our spiritual lives rest. It should be the most important resource of our lives. End of quote. Christ, Adam, Enoch, Noah, Ahab, Moses, Peter, James, and John, Joseph Smith, and many other noble and great ones played a part in the great creator, creative enterprise. I think we'll be astounded at how many great and noble ones played a role in the creation of the earth and maybe even ourselves. In other words, Christ and all those associated with the creation and the direction of the Father did what God wanted, how he wanted it done, and when he wanted it done in the creation of this earth. Thus, it was accomplished by faith. Faith is power, the power of God, the power by which worlds are and were created. To create is to organize, is an utterly false and uninspired notion to believe that the world or any other thing was created out of nothing, or that any created thing can be destroyed in a sense of annihilation. The elements are eternal. That's Dr. Cummins 9333. Joseph Smith in the King Follett Sermon said, Quote, you ask the learned doctors why they say the world was made out of nothing, and they will answer, doesn't the Bible say he created the world? And they affirm from the word create that it must have been made out of nothing. Now, the word create came from the word baru, barua, which does not mean to create out of nothing, it means to organize, the same as a man would organize material and build a ship. Hence, we infer that God has materials to organize the world out of chaos, chaotic matter which is element, and in which dwells all the glory. Elements had an existence from the time he had. The pure principles of elements are principles which can never be destroyed. They may be organized and reorganized, but not destroyed. They had no beginning and can have no end. President Joseph Fielding Smith said, quote, This earth was not the first of the Lord's creations. An infinite number of worlds have come rolling into existence at his command. Each is an earth, many are inhabited with his spirit children. Each abides the particular law given to it, and each will play its part in the redemption, salvation, and exaltation of that infinite host of the children of an almighty God. The Lord has said that his work and glory is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life for his children on all the inhabited worlds he has created. Such details of the creative process and the order of events in it has been revealed pertain only to this earth. In the temple, we receive the clearest understanding of what took place and how it was accomplished. Abraham has left reserved us an account of the planning and decisions of the creators at the time that they counseled among themselves to form the heavens and the earth. That's in Abraham chapter 4 verse 5. In the book of Moses and Genesis, I'm sorry, that's in Abraham's chapters 4 and 5. In the books of Moses and Genesis, we have revealed accounts of the actual physical creation of the earth. The second chapter of Moses and the first chapter of Genesis give the events which occurred on its consecutive creative days. Then the third chapter of Moses and the second chapter of Genesis, by way of interpolation, amplification, and parenthetical explanation, recount the added truths that all things were created spiritually before they were naturally upon the face of the earth. There is no revealed account of the spirit creation. Only this explanatory interpolation that all things had been created in heaven at a previous time. That this prior spirit creation occurred long before the temporal natural creation is evident from the fact that spirit men, men who themselves were before created spiritually, were participating in the natural creation. Things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. A difficult and obscure passage? Not really. Paul is simply saying that 
created things were not made out of or by things which are seen. That is, all created things, this earth, and all that is thereon, are things which are made not by man's power, not by some undirected forces of nature of the universe. There was no happenstance in creation, no chance creation of life in premortal swamps, no development up from one species to another by evolutionary processes. The creation was planned, organized, and controlled. It came by God's power, by faith. It came by a power that does not appear and is not seen and understood by the carnal mind or the scientific intellect. The creation is God's doing. Things came into being by forces which do not appear to man and can in fact be known only by revelation. And as God created all things by faith, even so his created handiwork can be known and understood only by that same power, the power which is faith. Hebrews 11.4, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, From the scriptural records available to us, from the sermons of the prophets, and from a knowledge of the revealed requisites for being a son of perdition, we know that Cain was a liar and a rebel in pre-existence. Isn't that interesting? Cain was already a rebel and a liar before he ever came. That like Lucifer, he had power and influence there. That in this life, he was taught the gospel, received the priesthood, and knew of the divinity of the Lord's work. That he then came out in open rebellion against God. That he, in fact, loved Satan more than God, choosing to worship and serve that evil one rather than the Lord. And that he offered false sacrifices at Satan's behest and slew Abel because the devil directed him to do so. Abel, on the other hand, was a righteous and obedient man who walked in holiness before the Lord. He was the head of the Adamic dispensation, and he believed in Christ and offered sacrifices as directed by the Lord in similitude of the coming of the sacrifice of the Son of God. The prophet Joseph Smith explained why Abel's offering was acceptable to God and Cain's offering was not. By faith in this atonement or plan of redemption, Abel offered to God a sacrifice that was acceptable, which was the firstlings of the flock. Remember, that was the commandment. Cain offered of the fruit of the ground. It was not accepted because he could not do it in faith. He could not he could have no faith or could not exercise contrary to the plan of heaven. He couldn't, the object of offering animals there was to put your faith in Christ in his offering as a lamb. Cain's offering had no symbolism of any of that. It must be the shedding of blood, the blood of the only begotten to atone for man, for this was the plan of redemption, and without the shedding of blood was no remission. And as the sacrifice was instituted for a type by which man was to discern the great sacrifice which God had prepared, to offer a sacrifice contrary to that, no faith could be exercised, because redemption was not purchased in that way, nor the power of atonement instituted after that order. Consequently, Cain could have no faith, and whatever is not the faith is sin. There was no type or similitude in offering the first fruits of the ground. Christ said that was to be done by the firstling of the flock. But Abel, off, but Abel offered an acceptable sacrifice, but which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God himself testifying of his gifts. Certainly the shedding of the beast of blood could be beneficial to no man, except it was done in imitation or as a type or explanation of what was to be offered through the gift of God himself, and this performance done with an eye looking forward in faith on the power of the great sacrifice for remission of sins. 
But however various may have been, and may be at the present time, the opinions of men respecting the conduct of Abel and the knowledge which he had on the subject of atonement, it is evident in our minds that he was instructed more fully in the plan than what the Bible speaks of. For how could he offer a sacrifice of faith, looking to God for remission of his sins and the power of the great atonement, without having been previously instructed in that plan? And further, if he was accepted of God, what were the ordinances performed further than the offering of the firstlings of the flock? It is said by Paul in his letter to the Hebrews, brethren, that Abel obtained a witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. To whom God testified the gifts of Abel, was it to Paul? We have very little on this important subject in the forepart of the Bible. But it is said that Abel himself obtained witness that he was righteous. Then certainly God spoke to him. Indeed, it is said that God talked with him. And if he did, would he not, seeing that Abel was righteous, deliver to him the whole plan of the gospel? And is not the gospel the news of the redemption? How could Abel offer a sacrifice and look forward with faith on the Son of God for remission of sins and not understand the gospel? The mere shedding of the blood of beasts or offering of anything in sacrifice could not procure a remission of sins except it were, it were performed in faith of something to come. If it could, Cain's offering must have been as good as Abel's. And if Abel was taught of the coming of the Son of God, was he not also taught of his ordinances? We will admit that the gospel has ordinances. If so, it had it not always ordinances, and were not ordinances always the same? If we may be permitted to reason, as the prophet did here, and if Cain could not exercise faith contrary to the plan of heaven, then how can anyone exercise faith in any false ordinances? Thus, if infant baptism or any of a hundred unscriptural or paganized organized practices are contrary to the plan of heaven, how can anyone have faith in their efficacy? And if faith is not present in religious rites, can we reach any other conclusion with reference to them that, than that whatever is not of faith is sin? Is not God rejection of Cain for offering a false sacrifice, a type of which his decree is that shall be relative to all false ordinances? Hebrews 11.4, He being dead yet speaketh, meaning how doth he yet speak? The prophet Joseph Smith asked his, his answer why he magnified the priesthood which was conferred upon him and died a righteous man and therefore has become an angel of God by receiving his body from the dead, holding still the keys of his dispensation, and was sent down from heaven unto Paul to minister consoling words and to commit unto him a knowledge of the mystery of godliness. And if this was not the case, I would ask, how did Paul know so much about Abel? And why should he talk about his speaking after he was dead? Hence, that he spoke after he was dead must be by being sent down out of heaven to administer. So there's a whole part of scripture we do not have of Abel coming to Paul and teaching him. Hebrews 11.5, Enoch, Joseph Smith said that Enoch held the priesthood of a dispensation of the gospel and that Paul was acquainted with him and re received instructions from him, meaning that Enoch, by then a resurrected being, ministered to Paul. Translation, and Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him, as he did also the whole city of Zion. That is, Enoch and the righteous saints were translators taken to heaven without tasting death. Now this Enoch, the prophet Joseph Smith said, and it applies also to all inhabitants of the holy city founded by him, God reserved unto himself that he should not die at that time, and appointed unto him a ministry unto terrestrial bodies of whom there has been very little revealed. Then of the matter of translation itself, the prophet Joseph Smith said, 
Many have supposed the doctrine of translation was a doctrine whereby men were taken immediately into the presence of God and into a fullness, into an eternal fullness. But this is a mistaken idea. Their place of habitation is that of a terrestrial order and a place prepared for such characters he held in reserve to be ministering angels unto many planets and who has yet not entered into so great a fullness as those who are resurrected from the dead. During the first 2,200 or so years of the earth's history, that is, from the fall of Adam to the ministry of Melchizedek, it was a not uncommon occurrence for faithful members of the church to be translated or taken into heaven, heavenly realms, without tasting death. Since that time, there have been occasional special instances or of translation, instances in which a special work of the ministry required it. It is from the account of the translation of the three Nephites that we gain most of our knowledge of the present ministry among men of translated beings. It is very evident that such persons never taste of death, never endure the pains of death, that they have undergone a change in their bodies, that they might not suffer pain nor sorrow, save it were for the sins of the world, and that they were holy men sanctified in the flesh that the powers of the earth could not hold them, that they were as the angels of God ministering to whomever they will, and that they shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye from mortality to immortality at the second coming, and that they shall then inherit exaltation in the kingdom of God. That's 3 Nephi chapter 28. Hebrews 11.6 He that cometh to God must believe that he is. Paul taught us if we are to, become, to, are to come to God, we must believe that he is. The lectures on faith, we read that three things are necessary in order that any rational and intelligent being may exercise faith in God unto life and salvation. First, the idea that he actually exists. Second, a correct idea of his character, perfections, and attributes. And then thirdly, an actual knowledge that the course of life which he is pursuing is according to his will. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, meaning by faith, doing what God wants, when God wants it done, and how he wants it done, men are born again. They become new creatures of the Holy Ghost. The souls are sanctified. They are purified. They become clean and spotless and are candidates for celestial glory. And such are the only ones with whom God is well pleased. Hebrews 11.7, Noah. Noah, who is Gabriel, the prophet Joseph Smith said, stands next in authority to Adam and is the father of all living in this day. He received the same keys, covenants, powers, and glories possessed originally by Adam, presided over a gospel dispensation, and proclaimed its truths to the people of his days. But we have so much lacking in our Bible, don't we? I hope there's probably more of it on the brass plates than if I had, and I hope we get that someday. Hebrews 11, chapter 7 through, verses 7 through 12, and then verses 29 through 35, faith precedes the miracle. Many of the righteous accomplishments recorded in Hebrews 11 may be regarded as miracles. President Thomas S. Monson taught that the tests of faith come before miracles happen. Quote, faith precedes the miracle. It has ever been so and ever and shall ever be. It was not raining when Noah was commanded to build an ark. There was no visible ram in the thicket when Abraham prepared to sacrifice his son Isaac. Two heavenly personages were not yet seen when Joseph knelt and prayed. First came the test of faith and then the miracle. End of quote. Hebrews 11.8, Abraham left his homeland on faith. He didn't know exactly where the Lord was taking him. The friend of God and the father of the faithful, one of the noble and great in pre-existence, he received the dispensation of the gospel. He held a priesthood, married for eternity, saw God, and received the promise that his literal seed after him should have the right to all gospel blessings. Now all others who received the gospel would be adopted into his family and accounted his seed. Included in the covenant of God with Abraham was the promise that he and his seed after him should possess the land of Canaan. 
Hebrews 11.9, Abraham and his family sojourned in the land of promise as living out their lives in a strange or foreign land, dwelling in tabernacles or meaning tents. The phrase heirs with him of the same promise meant what were the promises given each in turn to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and for that matter to Sarah, Rebekah, and Rachel, and to their other wives. For neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. In an initial and preliminary sense, they deal with lands and temporal seed. They and their children after them are to inherit the land of Canaan, and their posterity figuratively is to be innumerable as the sands upon the seashore and the stars of heaven. But in a fuller and more complete sense, the promise deals with celestial marriage, with the continuation of the family unit in eternity, with eternal increase, with having spirit children forever, so that literally they will outnumber the particles of the earth and the near infinite number of stars in all the galaxies of the side real heavens. And in this greater and more important sense, all these same blessings become the inheritance of all saints who live the law of Abraham and enter into the order of matrimony, which blessed his life and that of Isaac and Jacob. Can you see why homosexuality can never then be a true doctrine or ever happen? Two women and two men in the next life cannot produce offspring. And to become like God is to continue the family unit as man and wife. That is the doctrine of why homosexuality will never become a doctrine of God. Hebrews 11, verse 10, looked for a city. Abraham wanted to join the celestial city of Zion, Enoch City, where his predecessor Melchizedek had also gone with his people, a city of God which other prophets also sought. As far as we know, instances of translation since the days of Melchizedek and his people have been few and far between. After recording that Enoch was translated, Paul says that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their seed after them, they obviously knowing what had taken place as pertaining to the people of Melchizedek and others, looked for a city which had foundations whose builders and maker is God. That is, they sought for the city of Enoch, which God had before taken. But as Paul said, and as the Lord confirmed by Latter-day Revelation, even these holy men found it not because of wickedness and abominations, not of them, but the wickedness and abominations of the people on the earth and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth, but obtained a promise that they should find it and see it in their flesh, that they would one day in the resurrection finally inherit exaltation. This promise that the city of Zion shall return, and that holy men of all ages in their resurrected state shall dwell therein, will have millennial fulfillment. Of that glorious day the Lord said unto Enoch, Then, during the millennium, shall they and all that thy city meet them there, and we will receive them into our bosom. And they shall see us, and we shall fall upon their necks, and they shall fall on our necks, and we shall kiss each other. And there shall be mine abode, and it shall be Zion, which shall come forth out of all the creations which I have made. For the space of a thousand years shall the earth rest." So the Zion which we create on earth and the Zion that Enoch made will come together one day during the millennium. The Enoch and his people will come back down and unite with the Zion upon the earth. Hebrews 11 verse 11. Sarah's initial reaction to the divine promise that she, though well stricken in years and past childbearing age, would bear a son, was one of incredulity and doubt. But, and it is ever thus, the promise came to pass by faith. Sarah, on more mature consideration, believed God and therefore reaped the blessing. Sarah was at least 90, well past the age of childbearing, but she believed him faithful who promised. Hebrews 11:12. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead is a reference to Abraham, who was at least 100 years old at the time. 
Hebrews 11, 13 through 16. All, these all died in faith, not having received the promises. Paul wrote that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Sarah died with the faith and the Lord's promise to them of innumerable posterity and a land of promise, even though those promises were not yet fulfilled in this lifetime. Abraham left his homeland in the land of Ur without faith, not knowing where the Lord had taken him and his family. He and his son and his grandson have lived out their lives in a strange country. But Abraham knew that he was ultimately seeking to join a city whose builder and maker is God, the celestial city of Zion, also called the city of Enoch or the city of God. The prophet Melchizedek had also gone to this city with his people. Many of the Lord's choicest blessings must wait until after physical death to be received. Elder Spencer J. Condy explained, while serving as a member of the Seventy, important components of faith are patience, long-suffering, and enduring to the end. And Paul, the Apostle Paul recounted the faith of Abraham and Sarah, concluding that these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. These faithful saints knew that this earth life was a journey, not their final destination. End of quote. Strangers and pilgrim on earth phrase meaning those who seek salvation, here described as a place in heavenly city, account themselves as strangers and pilgrims on earth. They know their eternal home is with God, that they live and dwell in his presence and pre-existence, that they have come here into mortality so to sojourn and gain experience for the moment, that life is a pilgrimage to a place far removed from the eternal home, home eternal, and that if they fulfill their appointed journey well, they shall return to the place of beginning where they are no longer strangers, but have full knowledge of that city and country which, amid all the turmoil and strife of life, they have nonetheless sought with full purpose of heart. Chapter, or, uh, chapter 11, verse 14, they seek a country, meaning means a place in heaven. Chapter 11, verses 15 through 16, As Abraham left Ur for a better country, so the saints desire, when they leave mortality, to gain a better country, even an inheritance in a heavenly city. Chapter 11, verse 16, the phrase, God is not ashamed to be called their God, meant, is God ashamed to be called the God of those who break his laws and reject his eternal truths? If men draw near him with their lips, but remove their hearts from him, is he ashamed to own them? Will the Son of Man be ashamed to own those who live worldly lives when he comes in all the glory of his kingdom? But here the promise is that God shall not be ashamed of his own. Indeed, what greater endorsement could he have given of the righteousness of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob than to say to Moses that deity himself should be identified unto the children of Israel as the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and that this is my name forever and this is my memorial unto all generations. Hebrews eleven seventeen. Notice Paul's careful chosen words describing Isaac as Abraham's only begotten son, an obvious association of Abraham and Isaac with the father and the son. In the Book of Mormon, Jacob 4, 5 says, It was accounted unto Abraham in the wilderness to be obedient unto the commands of God in offering up his son Isaac, which is the similitude of God and his only begotten son. Thus, only two beings in all Scripture have the distinction of being designated only begotten Son. One is the Savior, the other Isaac. In all history, there is scarcely a more soul-wrenching moment than on the Mount Moriah nearly 4,000 years ago when faithful Abraham, at God's command, raised his knife to slay Isaac, his only begotten who can conceive of a more severe test of faith than the heaven-sent order to sacrifice the heir of promise, the heir whom God must then raise from the dead, that his promises concerning Isaac must be fulfilled. 
Is it any wonder that in all succeeding generations the seed of Abraham have looked back with awe and reverence upon a scene which tests mortal men almost beyond power to obey? Why did Deity devise such a test? Certainly it was for Abraham's blessing and benefit. There can be no question that the harder the test, the higher the reward for passing it. And here Abraham laid his all on the altar, thus proving himself worthy of that exaltation which he has now received. And immediately following his conformity to the divine will, he received a heavenly manifestation of the glory and honor reserved for him and his seed. In other words, Abraham needed to learn something about Abraham. And so will we. We will all be tested in like manner. Not the exact test, but in like manner. We will be tested with severe tests to learn things about ourselves to qualify for exaltation. Certainly also Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac was intended to be an example forever of that perfect obedience which the Lord expects of all the heirs of promise. Abraham, the Lord said to Joseph Smith, was commanded to offer his son Isaac. Nevertheless, it was written, Thou shalt not kill. Abraham, however, did not refuse, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. And in principle, the Lord tests and tries all his saints to see if they will abide in his covenant, even unto death, that they may be found worthy. They must needs be chastened and tried, even as Abraham, who was commanded to offer up his only son. For all those who will not endure chastening, but deny me, cannot be sanctified. And for those whose sacrifice are acceptable, the Lord provides an escape, a ram in the thicket, so that they and their righteous works are preserved. Hebrews 11.19 Even as God would yet raise his only begotten from death to glorious immortality, so Abraham knew that if he slew Isaac at God's command, that same God would have would have to raise Isaac again to mortal life, that the promise might be fulfilled, and Isaac shall thy seed be called. So the reason why Abraham had so much faith, he knew that if he did kill him on the altar, then God would just raise him from the dead. He had that much faith in Jehovah. Hebrews 11.20, Isaac blessed Jacob. Jacob's blessing for himself personally and for his posterity after him as a nation and as a people included this inspired utterance, let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be thee Lord over thy brethren and let thy mother's son bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that cursed thee and blessed be he that blessed thee. Hebrews 11.21, Jacob blessed the sons of Joseph. In doing so, Jacob adopted them as his own, elevated them to the stature of separate tribes in Israel, promised that a multitude of nations should flow for them, and set Ephraim the younger before Manasseh the older. Hebrews 11.23-26, the pleasure of sin for a season. Though raised in Pharaoh's, ro Pharaoh's royal household, Moses chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a seeming, for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. President Dallin H. Oak spoke of how serving God, not transitory pleasure or wealth, leads to true happiness. Quote, Those who yield to the enticings of Satan may, as the scriptures say, enjoy pleasure for Enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, but that kind of pleasure can never lead to lasting happiness or eternal joy. Brothers and sisters, old and young, I plead with each of you to remember that wickedness never was happiness and that sin leads to misery. Young people, do not seek happiness in, glittering, in the glittering but shallow things of the world. We cannot achieve lasting happiness by pursuing the wrong things. Chapter 11, verses 23 through 31. Moses lived by faith, as did all the prophets. Their righteous acts were guided by the Lord. Old Testament account that seems to be historical recitations only are in fact the stories of men and women who by faith prevailed upon the Lord to intervene miraculously in the affairs of his people. 
With clear spiritual insight, Paul ties these Old Testament happenings to faith in Christ, thus making them examples to all who learn of them. Abraham 11.23 Amram and Jochebed, the parents of Moses, having faith in Christ, defied the decree of Pharaoh which dealt death to all male children, and the life of Israel's future God-giver was miraculously preserved. Here is this law to kill the males of the Hebrew children, if you find them, and they were still willing to have children, even under that law. Chapter 11, verses 24 through 26, reared and taught amid, amid all the wealth, splendor, and influence of Pharaoh's court, having at his command the prestige and power of royal household, knowing he was assured of life of ease and affluence, yet Moses, because of faith in Christ, chose to suffer with slaves and bondsmen of his own race rather than to accept the honors, wealth, and power of the greatest nation on earth. Chapter 11, verse 25, the people of God. Israel, the chosen race, the people who, though slaves of Egypt overloads, were chosen by a deity out of all the earth to be nations of priests and kings. Chapter 11, verse 26, the reproach of Christ. The scorn and contempt in which the saints are always held by worldly people. Chapter 11, verse 27, by faith he forsook Egypt. Israel went out from Egypt amid an overwhelming display of divine power. Pharaoh and the overlords whom they served were momentarily softened and made amenable to the departure of their bondsmen by a series of ten plagues, which were climaxed by the death of the firstborn in the homes of all the Egyptians. That the hand of the Almighty was manifest in the freeing of his people is evident to all. But how came the plagues? What, brought, what power brought them forth? What power turned the waters that were in the river to blood? How came the frog, the lice, the flies, and locusts? What caused the death of the cattle and the thunder and hell and fire to rain along the ground in three days of thick darkness and the death of all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that stood upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the manservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beasts? What power? Power brought all this to pass, and what caused six hundred thousand men plus women and children to unite as one man, to leave their flesh plots of Egypt and go forth into an unknown wilderness as commanded of the Lord by the mouth of Moses. How inspired Paul is when he teaches that all this and much more was wrought by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It leads us to wonder how much fasting, prayer, and humble pleading there was for a secrease from the burdens of slavery, how much meeting, meetings were held to teach the people what they should do, how many testimonies were born of the need to do the things they were commanded. Long intervals may have elapsed between each of the plagues while the people pled anew with the Lord for relief and were strengthened in their faith that they might qualify for manifestations of divine power. But sure it is that Moses and his Israelitish brethren went forth free from Egypt by that power which is named faith. Hebrews 11.28, the Passover. To commemorate Israel's deliverance from Egypt's bondage, the Lord commanded his people to keep the Feast of the Passover, a celebration pointing particularly to the fact that the angels of destruction passed over their homes of the faithful sons of Jacob when the, first, when the firstborns and all the families of Egypt were slain. Let it be known that it was by the power of faith that the Israelitish homes were spared. And if they of the chosen seed had not believed in their hearts that the Lord Jehovah would spare their firstborn sons, the angel of death would have taken them as he did the firstborn of Pharaoh and all the families of Egypt. Hebrews 11.29 What by the power of God, which is named faith, could cause the waters of the Red Sea to divide, so that the children of Israel could pass through on dry ground, while the waters were a wall unto them on the right hand and on the left. What miracle is like unto causing the floods to stand upright as in heap, and as water to be congealed in the heart of the sea? Is it any wonder that ever thereafter in Israel, and particularly among the Nephites, 
this transcendent event was used as an illustration of faith and power with various of the prophets teaching that if God parted the Red Sea, leaving the children through on dry ground, a fact known to and accepted by all Israel, why then question other miraculous things? Chapter 11, verse 30. Why did the host of Israel march around Jericho in silence once each day for six days with only the seven priests blowing their trumpets? Why did they go around seven times on the seventh day and then amid the seventh blast give forth a tumultuous shout? What was there in this ritualistic performance that caused the walls to fall down flat so that the armies of Israel should go straight into the city and utterly destroy all that was therein, save Rahab and her household? Surely, as Paul said, it was the faith in the hearts of the people, the faith that if they did as Joshua commanded, the city would be theirs. Chapter 11, verse 31, What saved Rahab and her father's household of all that she had and caused them to be adopted into Israel? Faith, yes, which, however, presupposed acceptance of Christ as the God of Israel and consequent repentance, an illustration which shows that salvation is available for all who turn to the Lord with full purpose of heart. Hebrews 11, 32, but why does Paul list Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David as illustrations of faith which flows from righteousness? Why not continue in the channel already charted and linked with Abraham, Enoch, Abraham, Moses, and others, such names as Elijah, who filled the heavens, calling down fire from the heavens on his enemies, raised the dead, and was taken by a chariot of fire into the realms of translated beings? Or Elisha, who parted the waters of Jordan with the mantle of Elijah, healed the waters of Jericho as also the pottage for the sons of the prophets, multiplied oil in the widow's vessel as also the bread and corn in Gilgal, cured Naaman of his leprosy, and then caused it to fall upon greedy Gazi, caused the iron axe to swim and smote the Syrian army with all blindness. Or Isaiah, or as assigned to Hezekiah lengthened the day, or Daniel, whose face saved him in lion's den, or Shadrach, Meshach, or Bendigo, upon whose body the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their heads singed, neither was their coats changed, as they walked in the midst of fiery furnace, or any of a host of prophets and righteous men, and deeds were legends and household of the Hebrews. Hebrews 11, 36-39 Miracles of faith go together, they are inseparable. Where faith is found, miracles abound. Where miracles are wrought, faith dwells in the heart of men. Miracles are the fruits of faith. No man since the world was had faith without having something along with it, the prophet Joseph Smith said. Thus Paul lists many miracles in verses 38 through 30, 33 through 38 that were obtained because of faith of the people of the church. But perhaps even more importantly, Paul lists the trials, afflictions, abuses the saints were able to endure because of their faith. Yes, it takes faith to live the gospel covenant in a fallen world. But too, it takes faith to endure suffering and even death, if that is the will of God, without becoming offended at God and charging him foolishly. Obviously, Paul was doing more than to illustrate to the Hebrew saints the great reservoir of faith found among their forebears. And having named such worthies as Enoch and the patriarch, he lists some of those whose lives were not all they should have been to show that even they ministered and labored and worked miracles by the same eternal power, which is faith. His choice of those who put at defiance the armies of nations and were able to subdue principalities and powers drives home the reality that faith does more than heal the sick, raise the dead, and work in the realm of spiritual things. It is also the power whereby wars are won, kingdoms are governed, and the Lord's purposes come, tri come, come off triumphant among the nations of men. Chapter 11, verse 32 Jephthe, of all of Paul's illustrations, that of using Jephthe as an example of great faith is the most difficult to understand. 
that this captain of Israelitish host was guided by deity in his triumphs over the armies of the Amorites is not open to question. Born the son of a harlot, Jephthah had nonetheless grown to that spiritual maturity where the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and where by faith he was led of the Lord in a very great slaughter of the people of Ammon. But his rash vow to offer as a burnt offering whatever should first come forth and meet him after his victories after his victories and the resultant sacrifice of his only daughter is either gross and unbelievable wickedness or the Old Testament account is false. In view of Paul's use of this of this one of God's Israel judgments as an example of faith, the presumption is that there is something amiss in the Old Testament record as we have it, and that Jephthah's vow and sacrifice were of a different nature than our present record indicates. Hebrews 11, 33-39, Persons in Scriptural History. Hebrews 11, 33-39 describe various persons throughout the scriptural history, including Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Enoch, and the widow of Zarethoth, and Isaiah. And a traditional belief is that Isaiah was son asunder. Hebrews 11, 40, God having proved, provided something, some better things for us. The Joseph Smith translation of Hebrews 11.40 brings out a greater lesson. It reads, God having provided some better things for them through their suffering, for without suffering they could not be made perfect. The bold is the thing Joseph Smith added. Brothers and sisters, there is power and blessings that are wrought through suffering that will try our faith and that if we be come through the suffering then those miracles happen because of our faith we are promised as the prophet smith was promised thine adversity and thy afflictions are but a small moment and then if thou endure it well god shall exalt thee on high and thou shalt triumph over all thy foes orson f whitney one of the quorum of the twelve apostles said no pain that we suffer no trial that we experience is wasted. It is ministered to our ed education, to the development of such qualities as patience, faith, fortitude, and humility. All that we'll suffer and all that we endure, especially when we endure it patiently, builds up our character, purifies our heart, expounds our souls, and makes us more tender and charitable, more worthy to be called the children of God. And it is through sorrow and suffering, toil and tribulation, that we gain the education that we came here to acquire, and which we will make us more like our father and mother in heaven. End of quote. Spencer W. Kimball said, Suffering can make saints of people as they learn patience, long-suffering, and self-mastery. The suffering of our Savior were part of his education. Though he were yet a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all of them that obey him. End of quote. The night before his crucifixion, he went to the garden called Gethsemane. There he knelt and prayed. Soon he was weighed down by deep sorrow and wept as he prayed. Latter-day Apostle Orson F. Whitney was permitted to see the Savior suffering in a vision. Seeing the Savior weep, he said, I was so moved at the sight that I also wept out of pure sympathy. My whole heart went out to him. I loved him with all my soul and longed to be with him as I longed for nothing else. Then the Savior took him into his arms and blessed him. What a vision by Orson F. Whitney. Doctrine and Covenants, section 122, verses 7 through 9. And if thou shouldest be cast into the pit, or into the hands of murderers, and the sentence of death pass upon thee, if thou be cast into the deep, if the billowing surge conspire against thee, if fierce winds become thine enemy, and if the heavens gather blackness, and all the elements combine to hedge up thy way, and above all, if the very jaws of hell shall open thy mouth wide after thee, 
of course, this is all being said to Joseph Smith. Know thou, my son, that all these things shall give thee experience and shall be for thy good. The Son of Man hath descended below them all. Art thou greater than he? That's what we need to ask when we go through our sufferings, when we feel they're too heavy to bear. Are we greater than the Savior? Are our sufferings greater than him? But the sisters, we are not going to teach him anything about suffering. We are not going to go back and tell him how hard it was. We are going to look at him in awe and see the marks in his hands and feet and in his side and weep with eternal joy. Finishing this scripture, Therefore, hold on thy way, and thy priesthood shall remain with thee, for their bounds are set, and they cannot pass. Thy days are known, and thy years shall not be numbered less. Therefore, fear not what man can do, for God shall be with you forever and ever. Hebrews chapter 2, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Hebrews 12, 1, so great a cloud of witness. In Hebrews 11, Paul provided a list of men and women who through their suffering and faith in the Lord accomplished many great things and moved toward perfection. Joel Smith's translation of Hebrews 11:40 clarifies the role of their suffering. God had provided something better, have provided some better things for them through their suffering. For without suffering, they could not be made perfect. With these examples as a backdrop, Paul exhorts his readers to greater faithfulness. Wherefore, seeing we also are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Paul referred to these men and women of the previous chapter as a cloud of witnesses. They can be looked to as witnesses because their lives bear witness to the power of faith in enabling us to perform righteous works. Paul may have also intended the phrase cloud of witness to introduce the metaphor of running a race in which the faithful saints of old are figured to be seen as the crowd of onlookers cheering on the runners. Life, he says, is a race. The saints are in the stadium running towards the goal of salvation. The witnesses of the past won the race in their day. Those who look to Christ and run as he ran shall gain the victory as he did. Both, both meanings convey the, that the powerful example of the ancient saints can give us strength and confidence to run the race that is set before us. Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Christ, meaning Christ is the prototype, the great example or pattern after him, run the race as he did. The phrase, the author and finisher of our faith, meaning the phrase author and finisher of our faith can also be rendered as the leader and perfecter of our faith. President Thomas S. Monson spoke of how the exhortation to endure by looking unto Jesus applies to us. Quote, Remember that we do not run alone in this great race of life. We are entitled to help, to the help of the Lord. To the Hebrews, the Apostle Paul urged, lay aside sin, let us run with patience and race that with patience the race that is set before us, looking for an example unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. End of quote. The leader and perfecter of our phrase, phrase means, in Hebrew 2.10, the word or author is cha translated captain. It is the father, not the son, who is the author in the sense of originator. The gospel originated with God. It is his plan of salvation, which we and Christ accepted in pre-existence. Chapter 12, verse 2, the phrase, endure the cross, despising the shame. Jesus' cross was a sign of extreme shame. Paul did not exaggerate when he called, through, he called the crucified Christ a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. A crucified person so far from being chosen, anointed, and sent by God was understood to be cursed by God. To the non-believers, it seems sheer folly to proclaim the crucified Jesus as God's Son, universal and coming judge of the world. The extreme dishonor of his death by crucifixion counted against any such claim. 
a century after Paul, just a martyr, noted how utterly offensive it was to acknowledge the divine status of a crucified man. They say that our mad madness consists in the fact that we put a crucified man in second place after the unchangeable and eternal God. Although crucifixion was considered by non-believers to be an ignominious way to die, the early saints saw obedience, humility, love, and power in Lord's crucifixion. The metaphor of discipleship was taking up one's cross and following the Savior. That is probably why the Pharisees wanted him crucified, because it was seen as a life of shame. And so people would think, oh, he must have been a shameful person, which the Savior was not. Hebrews 12.2, for the joy that was sent before him, Paul recorded that the Savior under the cross and despised the shame of it. He looked past the pain and public shame of his crucifixion and endured it, knowing that it would eventually bring joy for him and his followers. Hebrews 12.3, against himself, the revised version of the scripture says against themselves, a more difficult but well-attested reading. If correct, it will mean that sinners sin against themselves, either by wronging their own souls or by contradicting, or by contradicting their better selves. That brings a whole new light into sin. Hebrews 12.4, resisted unto blood phrase means, this our Lord did in his warfare with sin. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when he took upon him the sins of the world, he sweat great drops of blood, and his suffering caused him to bleed at every pore. Paul's reasoning is, if he was steadfast to faith under his great burdens, how much more should we be with the lesser weight we carry? Hebrews 12.5, the phrase, the chastening of the Lord. By a process of chastening, the Lord helps prepare his saints for salvation. It is one of his ways of turning erring souls to paths of righteousness. As varying situations require, chastening may include rebuke for misconduct or subjection to trials and afflictions. It may even take the form of chastisement, meaning corporal punishment. Men are chastened for their sins to bring them to repentance because the Lord loves them. Chasing is designed to try the faith and the patience of the saints, and those who endure it will gain eternal life. Chasing is both mental and physical. The Lord and his prophets may rebuke and counsel people for their benefit, and the Lord may send calamities upon people to soften their hearts so that they will become more receptive to his will. Except the Lord doth chasten his people with many afflictions, yea, except he doth visit them with death and with terror and with famine and with all manner of pestilence, they will not remember him. That's Helam in the 12.3. And my people must needs be chastened until they learn obedience, if it must needs he by the things which they suffer. Dr. Covenants 101.6. Verily I say unto you concerning your brethren who have been afflicted and persecuted and cast out from the land of their inheritance. This is Lord speaking to the prophet Joseph Smith when the saints were kicked out of Jackson County, Missouri. The Lord is speaking of those driven from their homes in Jackson County by the mobs. I, the Lord, have suffered the affliction to come upon them, wherewith they have been afflicted in consequence of their transgressions. Yet I will own them, and they shall be mine in that day when I shall come to make up my jewels. Therefore they must needs be chastened and tried, even as Abraham, who was commanded to offer up his only son. For all those who will not endure chastening, but deny me, cannot be sanctified. Hebrews twelve six through eleven the Lord's chastening, scriptures attest to numerous purposes numerous purposes for the Lord's chastening. No one really enjoys the trials one must go through, but trials are essential to growth and eternal progress, and in that sense one can rejoice in them. In Hebrews twelve ten Paul taught that the Lord corrects us 
corrects us for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. His correction yields us the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Hebrews 12, 11. If we do not become bitter or resentful to God for the painful and often seemingly tragic ordeals of life, the Lord's correction can take many forms and it will always help to teach individuals as well as provide necessary correction. Chastening helps people remember the Lord, repent, receive forgiveness and deliverance, learn obedience, and become refined as gold. Chapter 12, verse 6, Scourgeth every son whom receiveth. Christ our Lord, with being without sin, was yet scourged before Pilate. How much more ought we, being burdened with sin, and needing whatever it takes to guide us to repentance and righteousness, bow humbly before our God, and bear up under his chastening rod? And for our good he uses that rod in one way or another, the more devoted and faithful saints oftentimes being subject to greater trials and sufferings than any others as witness the very ones named by Paul in his discourse on faith. El Hortal de Christophers in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles said of the Lord's chastening, Correction is vital if we will conform our lives unto a perfect man, that is, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Paul said of divine correction or chastening, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Though it is often difficult to endure, truly we ought to rejoice that God considers us worthy or worth the time and trouble to correct. Hebrews 12, 7, It is for chastening ye endure, that is, your sufferings are designed as discipline or means of education. God dealeth with you as with sons. Hebrews 12, 8, Bastards. Since a bastard is an illegitimate child, one born out of wedlock, Paul aptly and poignantly uses this term to describe those who are not sons of God, who have not been adopted into the family of God as joint heirs with Christ. According to his terminology, these are sons on the, there are sons on the one hand and bastards on the other. The sons inherit the fullness of the Father's kingdom. The bastards, never having been born of God, are cast out of the eternal family as though they were illegitimate. They become servants to minister for those who are worthy of a far more and exceedingly and eternally weight of glory. Hebrews 12, 9-10, Paul speaks of pre-existence and exaltation. In Hebrews 12, 9, Paul affirms the doctrine that all people are spirit children of God the Father. Pre-existence in the term commonly used to describe the premortal existence of the spirit children of God the Father. Speaking of this prior existence in the spiritual sphere, the first pertinence to the church, who was Joseph F. Smith, John R. Wander, and Anthony H. Lund said, all men and women are in the similitude of the universal father and mother and are literally the sons and daughters of deity. As spirits, they were the offspring of celestial parentage. This spirit beings, the offsprings of external parents, were men and women appearing in all respects as mortal persons do, expecting only that their spirit bodies were made out of more pure and refined substance than the elements for which mortal bodies are made. To understand the doctrine of pre-existence, two great truths must be accepted. One, God is a personal being in whose image man is created, an exalted, perfected, and glorified man of holiness, and not a spirit essence that fills the immensity of space. And two, that matter or element is self-existent and eternal in nature. Creation be merely the organization and reorganization of that substance, which was not created nor made, neither indeed can be. Unless God the Father was a personal being, he could not have begotten spirits in his image. And if there had been no self-existent spirit elements, there would have been no substance from which those spirit bodies could have been organized. From this 
From the time of their spirit birth, the father's pre-existent offspring were endowed with agency and subjected to the provisions of the laws ordained for their government. They had power to obey or disobey and to progress in one field or another. The first principles of man are self-existent with God. The prophet Joseph Smith said God himself finding he was in the midst of spirits and glory because he was more intelligent, he saw proper to institute laws whereby the rest could have a privilege to advance like unto himself, end of quote. The pre-existent life was thus a period undoubtedly an infinitely long one of probation, progression, and schooling. The spirit hosts were taught and given experiences and various administrative capacities. Some so exercised their agency and so conformed to law as to become noble and great. These were foreordained before their mortal burst to perform great missions for the Lord in this life. Christ, the firstborn, was the mightiest of all the spirit children of the Father. Mortal progression and testament is a continuation of what began in pre-existence. The phrase being a subjection unto the father of spirits and lives means serve the father in the name of the son and gain eternal life. President Dallin H. Oaks taught regarding the importance of understanding this doctrine. Consider the power of the idea taught in our beloved son, I am a child of God. Here is the answer to one of life's greatest questions. Who am I? I am a child of God with a spirit lineage to heavenly parents. That parent defines our eternal that parentage defines our eternal potential. That powerful idea is a potent antidepressant. It can strengthen each of us to make righteous choices and to seek the best that is within us. Establish in the mind of a young person the powerful idea that he or she is a child of God and you have given self-respect and motivation to move against the problems of life. End of quote. Brothers and sisters, that is our true identity. Not our gender, not our sex, not our race, not our whatever a million other things these false philosophies have come up with. Our true identity is that we are literal, the son and daughter, spirit sons and daughters of a living heavenly father and mother. Chapter 12, verse 10, partakers of his holiness, meaning ye shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. The whole purpose of the gospel and creation itself is to enable men to become like God, to be perfect as he is their, as is their father in heaven, to be like deity when he appears and to be partakers of the divine nature, to be gods themselves. 12.11, those saints who yield in the true spirit of, to chastening increase in personal righteousness. Chapter 12.12-13, 12, 12 through 13, it is the duty of those who serve in the church to succor the weak, lift up the hands which hang down, and strengthen the feeble knees. Verse 13, the phrase, that which is lame, means the spiritually lame, those who are weak in the faith and who need to be healed spiritually. Chapter 12, verse 14, the phrase, see the Lord. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Meaning that every person who perfects his life shall see God here and now, while he yet dwells in the flesh. And that if he continues in grace, he shall also see and dwell with him everlastingly in the realms of immortal glory. As revealed to Joseph Smith, the divine law enabling man to see deity is couched in these words from Doctrine and Covenants 93.1. Verily, thus saith the Lord, it shall come to pass that every soul who forsaketh his sins and come unto me and call on my name and obey my voice and keep my commandments shall see my face and know that I am. It will be done in his time and in his way. Though, through Joseph Smith, the Lord also said to all those who hold his holy priesthood, It is your privilege and a promise I have given to you that have been ordained unto this ministry, that as a ministry you strip yourselves from jealousies and fears and humble yourselves before me. For ye are not yet sufficiently humble. The veil shall be rent, and ye shall see me and know that I am. Not with the carnal mind, neither natural mind, but with the spiritual 
For no man has seen God in any time of the flesh except quickened by the Spirit of God. And the revelation on the priesthood says that without the power of the godliness, which is righteousness, no man can see the face of God and even the Father and live. The prophet Joseph Smith also taught, It is the privilege of every elder to speak of things of God. And could we all come together with one heart and one mind and perfect faith, the veil might as well be rent today as next week or any other time. And if we will but cleanse ourselves and come before God to serve him, it is our privilege to have an assurance that God will protect us at all times. End of quote. 12.15, looking diligently, meaning keep the commandments least through bitterness, members of the church are led astray. And how true it is that bitterness towards church officers and members leads to loss of faith and devotion and eventually defilement. Hebrews 12.12-16, 12, 12 Esau. Paul included a strongly worded characterization of Esau to teach the saints to teach that the saints should not be immoral or profane. A profane person is one who treats holy things with carelessness or contempt, as when Esau sold his birthright to Isaac for a little food. The word it in the final line of verse 17 refers to the blessing or birthright that Esau sought after trading it away. Hebrews 12, 18-24, exalted saints belong to the church of the firstborn. What God did for Moses in the sight of all Israel was a type and shadow of what he will do for all the faithful saints when they, through the sanctifying power that is in Christ, become as Moses, their proto prophet and prototype. Before all Israel attended by a display of omnipotence that defies description, the Lord Jehovah came down upon Mount Sinai and spoke audibly so that all the assembled millions of the chosen people heard his voice. By way of preparation, the people had cleansed their clothes and sanctified their souls. Then as his harbinger, the Lord sent thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceedingly loud. In this setting, while the mount quaked and was wholly on fire with the smoke ascending as from a furnace, the Lord came down on Mount Sinai appearing and speaking to Moses. It was then that the great lawgiver received the Ten Commandments and other glorious revelations. But the people themselves went not up on the mount, lest they be consumed by the glory of God's presence. So strict was the command that they not partake of more than they were prepared to receive spiritually, that any living thing, whether man or beast, that overstepped the prescribed bounds, was slain. To all of this, well known to the Hebrew brethren, Paul alluded and then drew his doctrinal conclusions. No longer is there a restraining barrier to keep the people from seeing and communing with their God. The mountain is no longer Sinai, but Zion. And all those who have cleansed and perfected their souls shall be welcomed on the heavenly mountain and in the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, the city of exalted beings. And there in that heavenly realm where the saints shall see and know as Moses alone did in Israel shall be found such might, display, splendor, and omnipotence that the doings of Jehovah on Sinai, incomprehensible, glorious as they were, shall be but a blur image in comparison. What a great thing to look forward to. Chapter 12, 23-24, in the vision of the degrees of glory, those who can attain exaltation in the highest heaven or the celestial word are described among other ways as, These are they who come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, and the heavenly place, and the holiest of all. These are they who have come to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of Enoch and of the firstborn. These are they whose names were written in heaven, where God and Christ are the judge of all. These are they who are just men made perfect through Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, who wrought out the perfect atonement through the shedding of his own blood. Chapter 12, verse 22, Mount Zion, literally the mount adjoining Jerusalem and Palestine, and also near the new Jerusalem in Jackson County, Missouri, the place the Lord shall stand with his exalted associates when he comes again to reign on earth a thousand years. 
The phrase an innumerable company of angels means how many people by actual numbers shall be saved and exalted in the heavenly Jerusalem? Though the gate is straight and narrow, and though comparatively few of earth's present inhabitants shall be so rewarded, yet the total number who actually do so obtain shall be large beyond comparison. John speaks in one place of ten thousands times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, which is a hundred millions plus unspecified millions, and in other and in another a great multitude which no man can number. It should be remembered that this host shall include the millions of children who have died before they arrive at the years of accountability, as well as the innumerable hosts who have passed through the mortal, mortal probation in that millennial day when children shall grow up without sin unto salvation. 12, chapter 12, verse 23, the phrase, Church of the Firstborn. This is the church which exists among exalted beings in the celestial realm, but it has its beginnings here on earth. Members of the church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints, who so devote themselves to righteousness that they receive the higher ordinance of exaltation, become members of the church of the firstborn. Baptism is the gate to the church itself. But celestial marriage is the gate to membership in the church of the firstborn, the inner circle of the faithful servants who are heirs of exaltation and the fullness of the Father's kingdom. The church of the firstborn is made up of the sons of God, those who have been adopted into the family of the Lord, those who are destined to be joint heirs with Christ in receiving all that the Father hath. If you keep my commandments, you receive of his fullness and be glorified in me as I have been the Father. And all those who are begotten through me are partakers of the same glory and are of the church of the firstborn. The phrase spirits of just men made perfect in chapter 12 means these are in the paradise of God awaiting the day of their resurrection and the final inheritance among exalted beings. There are two kinds of beings of heaven, the prophet wrote, naming the first as resurrected persons of having bodies of flesh and bones, and the second as the spirits of just men made perfect, they who are not resurrected but inherit the same glory. When a messenger comes saying he has a message from God, offer him your hand and request him to shake hands with you. If he be an angel, he will do so, and you will fill, it. You will fill his hand. If he be the spirit of a just man made perfect, he will come in his glory, for that is the only way he can appear. Ask him to shake hands with you, but he will not move, because it is contrary to the order of heaven for a just man to deceive, but he will still deliver his message. Chapter 12, verse 24, the phrase, the blood of sprinkling. The blood of Christ, so described because of the similitude set forth in the Passover of the children of Israel by the angel of death, even as the firstborn in the Israelites' homes were saved because of the blood of the Lamb was sprinkled on the lentil and side post of their doors. So all men may be saved by the blood of the Lamb who was slain from the foundations of the world. The phrase that speaketh things, better things than that of Abel means, is Paul here alluding to the ancient heresy that the blood of Abel was shed for the remission of sins? Had this false doctrine lingered among some of the Hebrews of his day? As the first gospel martyr, the shedding of blood, Abel's blood had gained great significance among the descendants of Adam. By the time of Abraham, however, the true understanding of Abel's sacrifice for martyrdom had been lost, or so lost and perverted, that deity felt disposed to say to the faithful, the father of the faithful, My people have gone astray from my precepts and have not kept mine ordinances, which I have given unto their fathers. And they have not observed mine anointing and the burial or baptism wherewith I command them, but have turned from the commandments and taken unto them themselves the washing of children, that means baptizing children, and the blood of sprinkling, and have said that the blood of the righteous Abel was shed for sins, and have not known wherein they are accountable before men. So by the time of Abraham, those doctrines have been corrupted, and Jehovah tells Abraham to go teach them the true doctrines. 
But whatever the then prevailing view of the Hebrews may have been, Paul is here teaching that the blood of righteous Abel, together with the innocent blood of all the martyrs under the altar that John saw, cries unto the Lord for vengeance against the wicked. The blood of Christ, on the other hand, was poured out as a propitiation for sins, and through it men are empowered to repent and to be reconciled to God. Thus, the voice of Abel's blood is one of death and separation and sorrow. The voice of our Lord's blood is one of life and reunion and eternal joy. Truly, his blood speaketh better things than that of Abel. Chapter 12, verses 25 through 29, our God is a consuming fire. Verses 25 through 26, do not reject the blessings offered through the blood of Christ. If our Father... Fathers felt his wrath when they disobeyed the law he gave out of the darkness of the cloud of Sinai. How much more shall we be cursed for rejecting his word, preached to us openly and plainly in that day when he dwelt among us? If his voice, the voice of the Lord Jehovah, shook Sinai in ancient times, leaving Israel tremble, how much more shall the wicked fear him when he returns in all his glory of his father kingdom to shake not only the earth but the heavens also? Chapter 12, verse 26, as, he is as, as is his standard practice, Paul here attributes the words of Jehovah to Christ. Before his birth and mortality, and with reference to his second coming, the Lord said to the prophet Haggai, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens, and the earth, and the sea, and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms. End of Haggai. Seated on the Mount of Olives, some 500 years later, the same Jehovah, then dwelling in mortality, as the son of Mary said to his disciples of his second coming, Then shall the Lord set his foot upon this mount, and it shall cleave in twain, and the earth shall tremble, and reel to and fro, and the heavens shall also shake. Chapter 12, verse 27, At the second coming, every corruptible thing shall be consumed, and there shall be a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness, and that only shall remain which meets millennial standards. Chapter 12, verse 29, Our God is a consuming fire. Joseph Smith taught that those who gain exaltation dwell in everlasting burnings in immortal glory, and that God Almighty himself dwells in eternal fire. Flesh and blood cannot go there, for all corruption is devoured by the fire. When our flesh is quickened by the Spirit, there will be no blood in this tabernacle. We will have spirit in our veins when we are resurrected. And Paul applies the truth here involved to the second coming when the Lord's earthly vineyard shall be burned, when the elements shall melt with fervent heat, when the earth itself shall be burned as an oven, and all the proud, and yea, all that they do wickedly shall be as stubble. The fire of the second coming is the actual presence of the Savior, a celestial glory comparable to the glory of the sun or a consuming fire. So great shall be the glory of his presence that the sun shall hide its face in shame. The presence of the Lord shall be as the smeltering fire that burneth and as the fire that causeth the waters to boil. Elements shall melt with fervent heat and the mountains shall flow down at thy presence. Our last chapter, Hebrews chapter 13, Mary is honorable in all. Christ is the same everlastingly. The epistle concludes with various exhortations in regard to the social life, private life, the religious life in which correction the readers are exhorted to follow steadfastly the example and doctrine of their former teachers and to respect the authority of their present rulers. Verse 17. Paul requests their prayers. He prays himself on their behalf, verses 20 and 21, and he sends greetings and utters his benediction, verses 20 through 25. Hebrews 13, 1, the phrase brotherly love, Elder Joseph B. Worthland exhorted, Latter-day Saints are obliged to seek inner peace not only for the blessings it is to them, but so they can radiate its influence to others. In a Christmas message to the First Presidency, proclaimed that the Church has a divine commission to establish peace. 
Church members are to manifest brotherly love first towards one another, then towards all mankind, to seek unity, harmony, and peace within the church, and then by precept and example, extend these virtues throughout the world. End of quotation. Hebrews 13.2, some have entertained angels unawares. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, does this mean that the saints may unknowingly entertain, that is, provide food, clothing, lodging, and sociality for the angels of God in heaven, for spirit beings or for immortal or translated beings? Such a thought scarcely seems logical, although the disciples did provide food for the resurrected Lord. And according to Genesis 18 and 19, Angels ministered to both Abraham and Lot and were banqueted and otherwise cared for them. However, the inspired version more actually clarifies the experiences of Abraham and Lot. It appears that as Abraham sat in his tent door, three men stood by him. He addressed them as my brother and provided them with food and drink and was blessed by one of them. They are specifically called angels, and they spoke of the journey upon the Lord had sent them. They said they had a message for Sodom, and that the Lord had told them that unless they delivered it, the sins of the city would be on their heads. Then they, the record says, and the angels, which were holy men, were sent forth after the order of God, turned their face from thence, and went towards Sodom. As to Lot's experience, these three angels came to Sodom, where Lot made them a feast, and they became the cause of great contention between Lot and the wicked inhabitants of the city. In due course, the angels called down upon the name of the Lord for brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and thus they overthrew those cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, and all the plain. And again the record said the angels of God were holy men. Thus, among those who serve God as angels, that is, as his ministers and messengers, are righteous mortal men. And so Paul, with perfect propriety, calls the Hebrew saints to entertain other saints who may be serving on the Lord's errand as his messengers and his ministers, his angels. It would be interesting to know who the angels were who ministered Abraham and then to Lot, and who were in turn entertained by these brethren. Obviously, they were great and mighty men, for the Lord himself was personally present in connection with their appearance to Abraham. What we know that one of them blessed Abraham, and also from other sources that Abraham was blessed by and received the priesthood from Melchizedek. Could it be that one of these angels was Melchizedek? and that the three of them together comprised the first presidency of the church of their day? Hebrews 3, 4, Marriage is honorable in all. Celibacy is not of God. Normal men and women of adult ages should marry if they have proper opportunity to do so. To deliberately refrain from assuming marital and parental obligation is to fail the most important test of this mortal probation. The whole plan of salvation and exaltation centers and resolves around the family unit. Whoso forbids to marry is not ordained of God, for marriage is ordained of, of God unto man. The most important thing that any member of the church of Jesus Christ, the latter saints done in this world, are one, to marry the right person in the right place by the right authority, and two, keep the covenants made in connection with this holy and perfect order of matrimony thus assuring the obedient person of an inheritance of exaltation in the celestial kingdom. The phrase, the bed undefiled, is referring to sexual intercourse between a man and woman married to each other, is pure and proper. Whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge that phrase, Paul is saying, unless they repent, the whoremongers and adulterers, they shall be damned. Their home in the spirit world shall be hell. And their inheritance in, the eternal, in eternity, the lowest kingdom God has provided for man. For I, the Lord God, delight in the chastity of women, and whoredoms are an abomination before me. Thus saith the Lord. Hebrews 13.5 Let your conversations be without covetousness. It's changed by Joseph Smith. The Joseph Smith's translation of verse 5 reads, Let your consecrations be without covetousness. It is not simply enough to pay tithing or otherwise contribute to building up the kingdom. True saints make their contributions freely and willingly to the Lord without coveting what they have chosen to return to him 
whom gave them all. Thus the Lord said to Martin Harris, I command thee that thou shalt not covet thine own property, but impart it freely to the printing of the Book of Mormon, which contains the truth and the word of God. He was 13.5, Be content with such things as ye have. Inordinate longing or striving for unneeded worldly possessions is contrary to the spirit of the gospel. The saints should seek instead the riches of eternity and have a lesser concern about temporalities. Elder Neil A. Maxwell states, in just a few words, a major insight came to the consciousness and com the converted through Alma. For I ought to be content with the things which the Lord hath allotted me. However, just prior, Alma had urgently desired to be the trump of God so that he might shake the earth. But not because of ego. In fact, Alma wanted to declare repentance and the plan of redemption to all mankind so that they might be no more human sorrow. Yet Alma's contentment rested on the reality that God finally allots to us according to our wills. What could be more fair? The same contentment awaits us if our desires can be worked out through and aligned. What some mortals are allotted includes, for instance, very reduced chances because of poverty, and the people began to be distinguished by ranks according to the riches and their chances for learning. And some were ignorant because of their poverty, and others did receive great learning because of their riches. Furthermore, Melville malevolent human social structures have included in the past traffic constraints like slavery and concentration camps. Nevertheless, we are to do what we can with in our allotted acreage while still using whatever strength there might be in any tethers. Within what is allotted to us, we can have spiritual contentment Paul describes it as godliness with contentment, signifying and equate, pre, signifying the adequate presence of attributes such as love, hope, meekness, patience, and submissiveness. Yet there are other fixed limitations in life. For instance, some of allotted include, including physical, mental, or geographical constraints. There are those who are unmarried through no fault of their own, or yearning but childless couples. Still, others face persistent and unreconciled relationships within their circles of loved ones, including offspring who have become for themselves resistant to parents or counsel. In such and similar situations, there are so many prickly and daily reminders. Being content means acceptance without self-pity. Meekly born, however, deprivations such as these can end up being like excavations that make room for greatly enlarged souls. End of quote. Hebrews 13.5, the phrase, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. This is an adage in Israel, a universal promise to all the Lord's people in all ages. He gave it to Jacob, to Joshua, to Solomon, to all Israel, and it applies in principle to all who love his law and keep his word. He that seeketh me early shall find me, he said to Joseph Smith, and shall not be forsaken. The Lord is his people. The Lord is with his people. Hebrews 13, 6, being content with and rely upon what the Lord allotted us can help us rely upon God and not fear man. Joseph Smith learned this lesson when he lost 116 pages while translating the Book of, Lord, the Book of Mormon. If you remember, he gave in to Martin Harris's pleadings for the manuscript that got lost. The Lord said to him, And behold, how oft you have transgressed the commandments and the laws of God, and have gone on in the persuasions of men. For behold, you should not have feared man more than God. Although men set at naught the counsels of God and despise his words, yet ye should have been faithful, and he would have extended his arm and supported you against all the fiery darts of the adversary, and he would have been with you in every time of trouble. Joseph should have been content with the first time when the Lord said, No, I'm not giving the 116 pages to Martin Harris. Hebrews 13.7 Remember them which have the rule over you, Follow the counsel of the brethren, give heed to the general authorities, take direction from best your state's presence, and pattern your life after them, and follow their righteous examples. No one is required to follow anyone in unrighteousness. 
Hebrews 13.8, in addition to teaching God's eternal nature, this verse implies that the atonement is eternal in its effects and consequences. Elder Bruce R. McConkie taught the following concerning Christ's eternal nature. Jesus Christ is the Son of the God, the Father, the firstborn in the Spirit, the only begotten in the flesh. While yet in the Spirit, he progressed and advanced until he became like his Father, under whose direction he became the creator of all things, and was chosen to be the redeemer of the world. And to work out the infinite and eternal atonement, he came to earth to work out his own salvation and do the will of the Father and make salvation available to men. After his resurrection, he gained all power in heaven and on earth and became like his Father in all things. Thus, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is a being in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, and he is from everlasting to everlasting. In the vision of three of glories, he said of himself, The Lord is God, and besides him there is no Savior. Great is his wisdom, and marvelous are his ways, and the extent of his doings none can find out. His purposes fail not, neither are there any who can stay his hand. From eternity to eternity he is the same, and his years never fail. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, meaning that he never fills his course, that he always operates by law, that he is no respecter of persons, and always bestows the same blessings as a reward for the same obedience. For instance, he is a God of miracles, and therefore there are always miracles where there is faith. The lame walk and the dead are raised, mountains move, the sun stands still, the Red Sea parts, fires come down from heaven, wondrous things without end occur, whenever and where, whenever and wherever there is faith, and to whomever possesses this precious power. No better analysis of this principle is found in holy writ than given by Moroni in these words. I speak unto you who deny the revelations of God and say that they are done away, that there are no revelations, nor prophecies, nor gifts, nor healings, nor speakings with tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Behold, I say unto you, he that denieth these things know that God know not the gospel of Christ. Yea, he has not read the scriptures. If so, he does not understand them. For do we not read that God is the same yesterday and today and forever? And in him there is no variable, neither shadow of changing. And now if you have imagined up unto yourselves a God that doth vary, and in whom there is a shadow of changing, then ye have imagined up unto yourselves of God who is not a God of miracles. But behold, I show unto you a God of miracles, even the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And it is that same God who created the heavens and the earth, and all things that in them are. And who shall say that Jesus Christ did not many mighty miracles? And there were many mighty miracles wrought by the hands of the apostles. And if there were wrought, miracles wrought then, why has God ceased to be a God of miracles, and yet be an unchangeable being? And behold, I say unto you, he changeth not. If so, he would cease to be God. And he ceaseth not to be God, and is a God of miracles. We're only 9, 7 through 11, verse, and then verses 15 through 19. Christ is the same from eternity to eternity, meaning that from pre-existent state on into his immortal state, his course is one eternal round, meaning from one pre-existence to the next, his laws are the same, and that the people of the past eternity were saved by the same course of obedience that will bring eternal life to the pe people of future eternities. And all who follow the prototype and gain a like exaltation with him as joint heirs in his father kingdom shall be unchangeable and eternal beings who are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Then shall they be gods because they have no end. Therefore shall they be from everlasting to everlasting because they continue. What great promised blessings are all. For those in our exaltation, why would we not want to strive to become like that type of being? Hebrews 13, 9 through 16, Paul now exhorts the Hebrew saints to leave completely the dead letter of mosaic performances and come to the living power that is in Christ. Verse 9 to 16 condense, summarize, and allude to a wealth of gospel knowledge and have the following sense of meaning. 39. Do not be deceived. There is no salvation in the sacrifices altar, offered upon the altars of Israel. What counts is not the eating of the meat of animal sacrifices, but the sacrifices of a broken heart and contrite spirit. 
Verse 10, however, we Christians have an altar, the cross of Christ, wherein he offers himself for the sins of the world, but the full blessings of his atoning sacrifice are reserved for members of the church. They do not come to those without the fold. Those who serve the tabernacle, those who put their trust in the dead ordinance of the Mosaic law, such persons do not, as it were, partake of the meat sacrifice of the Christian altar. They do not partake of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper to renew the covenants made in the waters of baptism. Remember I told you that these Jewish converts were struggling with still wanting to keep the Mosaic law and offering animal sacrifice. Verses 11 through 12, even as the high priest in the day of Israel on the day of atonement burned the bodies of the animal sacrifices without the camp and brought only their blood into the Holy of Holies, that thereby the people might be freed from sin, so Christ our Lord was sacrificed without the gate of Jerusalem, that through the shedding of his blood he might cleanse and perfect his people and met them to celestial exaltation in the heavenly Holy of Holies. Verse 13, let us therefore leave the camp of Judaism, the camp peopled with non-members of the kingdom, and camp where trust is placed in animal sacrifice, and come unto Christ and the blessings of his blood, even though by doing so we bear the shame reproach placed upon him. Verse 14, and why would we worry about any temporal loss entitled by such a course? The things of this worth are fleeting and transitory anyway. What we seek through Christ is eternal and enduring. It is an inheritance in the heavenly city. Verses 15 through 16. What then are the sacrifices of the true Christian? They are unending praise and thanksgiving to the Father, who gave his only Son as a ransom for our sins. They are everlasting praise to the Son for the merits and mercy and grace of his atoning sacrifice. They are obedience to the laws of the Lord. These are the sacrifices that please God. Or as it was said by the Lord himself to his other sheep, Ye shall offer up unto me no more the shedding of blood. Yea, your sacrifices and your offerings shall be done away. For I will accept none of your sacrifices and your burnt offerings. And ye shall offer for a sacrifice unto me a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And whoso cometh unto me with a broken heart and a contrite spirit... Him will I baptize with fire and with the Holy Ghost. Hebrews 17, 13, 17, They that must give account, Christ's ministers are accountable for the sins of those over whom they preside and whom they are sent. I have sent thee a watchman into the house of Israel, the Lord said to Ezekiel. Therefore thou shalt hear the words at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his wicked, from his ways, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn him from it, if he do not turn from it, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou shalt be delivered, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Hebrews 13, 18, pray for us. The plural denotes that Paul identifies himself with the rulers of the church on whom, upon whom some, some sub, suspicion has fallen, and he therefore in their name protests their integrity. Verse 19, the singular number indicates that Paul stood in some special relationship to his readers from whom he is for the present separated for some reason not given. It seems not to have been imprisonment, and a separation is regarded as only temporary. Verses 20-21, through 21, Perfection and salvation are available by the grace of God through the shedding of the blood of Christ, which is the covenant of the Father unto the remission of your sins, that you become holy without spot. Hebrews 12, 22, exhortation, meaning suffer the word of exhortation, means to be teachable, to be accepted. To accept correction and chastening. Thank you. I know that was lengthy, but there are so many great, meaningful blessings and promises and examples of faith in these chapters of Paul. May we take these examples of faith of Paul that he has given us and may we exemplify them. May we try to become like them and thus in turn become like our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button.